Hi, I'm Rob Walker. The semiconductor industry is the engine which has driven our information revolution. The computers, cell phones, satellites, which have changed all our lives. And Fairchild Semiconductor was the mother of the industry. Fairchild put the silicon in Silicon Valley. Founded in 1957 by eight scientists, it quickly reached heights of influence and prestige, including the invention of the integrated circuit in 1959. Then beset by inept absentee management, it began hemorrhaging key people who left to found new semiconductor companies like Intel, AMD, National, LSI Logic, and many others. Finally, in 1986, it was sold to National Semiconductor for just $122 million. Today, Fairchild Semiconductor has been reconstituted and is headquartered in the bucolic Portland, Maine, away from the craziness of Silicon Valley. The Fairchild Chronicles is the story of the first 29 years of the West Coast company, both creative and chaotic, prolific and profane, told in the words of those who were there. It was a turbulent period representative of the 60s, replete with alcohol, fistfights, and arrogant behavior that most corporate histories don't discuss. During this period of creativity, the number of transistors which could be put on a chip went from one to over 100,000. Today, in 2005, that number has climbed to over 100 million. The story is told in eight chapters. In Intel Starts, Gordon Moore tells of why he and Bob Noyce left to form Intel. In Hogan's Heroes, Jerry Sanders tells of his remark that got him fired and on track to become president of AMD. Fairchild invented semiconductor design automation. That story is told by Jim Downey and Jim Cofort in the ASIC and CAD chapter. Lastly, in Schlumberger days, we hear of the blunders that finally brought down the company. This documentary was taken from interviews conducted between 1995 and 2002. The unedited interviews may be found online at silicongenesis.stanford.edu. So now let us begin with the founding. Well, what was, what was Bill Shockley like? Well, he was a, an unusual fellow. First of all, he was extremely competitive and controversial. If there were two ways of stating things, one of which was controversial and one of which was straightforward, he'd pick the controversial one every time. He just thrived on uh, stimulating controversy. Uh, he had phenomenal physical intuition. Uh, one of my colleagues once said he thought Shockley could see electrons. He had such a good idea what was going to happen. And uh, he was very competent uh, in the solid state physics area, and actually had been in other technical areas before that. Uh, but uh, he had some peculiar ideas on how to motivate people. And this was the first time he really took on a major management responsibility. At Bell Laboratories, he had run a relatively small research group. But here he was trying to set up a new enterprise. And uh, some of his ideas, frankly, didn't work out too well uh, for the success of that enterprise. Well, did he do polygraph tests on, on people? Well, that was one of the, the things that uh, happened. We had an incident in the, the laboratory where actually uh, a little uh, pinpoint was left in one of the doors and uh, a lady cut her hand on it a bit. And Shockley decided that was malicious and started trying to track down who had put this point there in order to hurt this lady. And got to the point where he was going to start going through the whole staff with the polygraph test. He didn't get very far with that one, however. We all kind of rebelled and uh, that one died. But there are so many incidents of what Shockley would do. Uh, in, one, in one instance, uh, uh, we were all sitting in together listening to a lecture given by uh, Tom Sa, C.T. Sa, Dr. Sa, who at that time knew more about uh, uh, 
uh, MOS type structures, I believe, than anybody else in the world, uh, and related structures to that. And Sal was giving us uh, a lecture on some of the uh, device physics, very much like what Andy Grove later, years later, started to do with Fairchild. And Shockley walked in at 8 o'clock in the morning and wanted to know what everybody was doing in the meeting room when they should be out working. So he dismissed the class entirely. And he said, by the way, what, are, what is Dr. Sa talking about? And, well, he's talking about device physics. He says, well, stay. I'll finish the talk for him. And he did. Anyhow, uh, Arnold Beckman, the founder of Beckman Instruments, was the uh, financing behind Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory. And Arnold came up to talk to us one time. And after he was done, uh, Shockley stood up and uh, made a few comments, ending with, if you're not happy with what you're, we're doing, I can take this someplace else, uh, which was completely uncalled for. Anyhow, we use that as a, uh, a reason to actually call Beckman and say, hey, that's not true. If Shockley tried to move here, uh, he'd have to go almost by himself. And uh, Beckman used that to say, uh, well, I, under I gather that things aren't going completely right there. What can we uh, do about it? And I, we agreed to have uh, a dinner meeting with Beckman. In fact, we ended up having several dinner meetings. I would guess four in retrospect, where uh, Beckman came up from Southern California, and a group of us met with him to see what steps could be taken uh, to improve the management situation at Shockley. The kind of thing we were looking at was something that put Shockley in a consulting position and brought in somebody who was an experienced general manager. Anyhow, on the last of these dinner meetings with Beckman, uh, you know, we had previously been exploring such things as getting Shockley a professorship at Stanford, but keeping him as a consultant. By that time, Shockley had won the Nobel Prize and it wouldn't, wasn't very difficult to find him a professorship someplace. Anyhow, someone had gotten to Beckman. Uh, I have heard a rumor that it was someone from Bell Laboratories and told Beckman that if he made this move, it would just ruin Shockley's career. So Beckman's attitude toward us changed, and he essentially said, hey, Shockley's the boss. You guys like it or whatever. At that time, we felt we had burned our bridges so badly that there was no way we could stick around working for Shockley after having gone around him to try to straighten out this problem. So one of the group that had been meeting with Beckman, the name of Gene Kleiner, had a friend who worked at Hayden Stone, the investment banking firm in New York at that time. And it said, essentially, there are a group of us that like working together we're all going to leave Shockley. Do you think there's a company that would like to hire the group? And the response was, uh, well, wait a minute. Uh, and one of the senior partners, the name of Bud Coyle, and a young Harvard MBA by the name of Arthur Rock came to California to meet with the group. Shockley was uh, uh, able to uh, recruit almost anyone he wanted because of his Nobel Prize, and he was considered quite intellect, and he, cons he was able to get a lot of these young scientists to um, go to work for him uh, at uh, Shockley Laboratory Division of Beckman Instruments. And after they were there a couple of years, I uh, became fairly disappointed with uh, Shockley. And, um, and uh, Eugene Kleiner was one of the seven who uh, had banded together and thought that they would like to get to quit uh, Shockley and uh, maybe get jobs together because there was no such thing in those days as forming a company and uh, with the amount of capital that they needed to enter the semiconductor business. And uh, so, uh, and to get financing for the company through some, uh, through one of the larger companies. And uh, so we agreed to do that, uh, the seven of us, and then Bob Noyce decided he would join, and then became eight. And then, of course, Shockley labeled, us, labeled them the treacherous eight. Um, 
So we uh, went through uh, all the likely suspects and uh, we uh, had gone through 35 of them. And these were companies, now this was 1957, and uh, there were a number of companies who were uh, trying to get into more technology and uh, they had expressed interest to us previously that they would like to get into more technology would we bring them in anything in technology we saw. But when we told them that the deal was that they would set up, lend us money and set up a separate company uh, and back it, they said no, they couldn't do that because they, didn't, they thought it would upset their organizations. So to, at a, just about that time, we were willing, we were about ready to give up when through a third person, uh, we met uh, Sherman Fairchild. So he had plenty of money and he was an inventor and he had invented the aerial camera and, um, and the airplane to uh, carry the camera. And so they, he set up two separate companies, Fairchild uh, Airplane and Fairchild Camera and Instrument Corporation. And he decided that he would have Fairchild Camera and Instrument um, put up the million and a half dollars that we felt we needed uh, in return for which they got an option to buy all of our stock. And the, uh, the stock was uh, divided uh, 10% for each of the eight and 20% for Hayden Stone. The senior group at uh, Shockley Labs had approached many companies and they'd been turned down. And, uh, and somehow you didn't turn them down. What was the reason for that? Well, I think the larger companies, they all thought they knew more than, than the group did. I mean, the GEs and the Westinghouses and companies like that who we're in the component business, tube business, and this would just been an adjunct. The Western Electric, uh, they had all the answers at Bell Labs. Uh, we at Fairchild were looking for an opportunity and recognized the talent that was there just if you looked at their pedigrees, at least certainly the top four or five of them from a technical point of view. And um, I had some years before been able to attend some of the Bell Labs uh, seminars on the tr early transistor and was intrigued on what this could could do and you know I saw a television set that was run completely with on transistors in the early 50s and this seemed to me an opportunity for Fairchild to get into a new business without any preconceived ideas mm -hmm. as to how to run it or how to go about well, it. Well there was no internal group doing that. No, none at all. So so that uh, probably made the difference. Yeah. There was no well, that. And I think it's interesting to note that every one of these major companies had never made a success from RCA, Westinghouse, GE, yeah. in, the, in the semiconductor business. The company was really in the right place at the right time. In the first place, we pursued this idea of a diffused silicon transistor that Shockley had been initially going to do. Uh, something that had been made in the laboratory at Bell Labs but uh, was not a commercial device at all. And we were the first ones to bring together, or to bring to the market what's known as a MESA transistor. And it was a silicon MESA transistor at that time. Uh, and uh, it was uh, quite a successful device on the scale that we were uh, working at least. Uh, but uh, that was only the, the first of several devices. Uh, that was, that was the first silicon transistor that was built by the, the batch process, where you make a lot of them on a wafer and then cut them up individually. And it was the first device in manufacturing that used photolithography to uh, produce the structures. So these were fairly important early developments. Uh, speaking of lithography, it reminds me that uh, when Fairchild started, we split the major processes that had to be developed among the participants there. And Bob Noyce had responsibility for setting up the lithography capability. 
uh, he went to San Francisco to a, a large camera store and dug through their supply of 35 millimeter movie camera lenses, uh, excuse me, 16 millimeter movie camera lenses, and picked out the three that were best matched insofar as uh, focal length was concerned. And those were the optics in the step and repeat camera we built to make the first transistor structures. Well, there was no, you had to build everything in those days. There was no industry that. that That's right. This. We were the first ones getting in that technology. I had responsibility for the diffusion furnaces, for example. I'd built furnaces previously, so we designed furnaces. And actually, uh, one of the very first spin offs to start a new company out of Fairchild was a result of that. Uh, Art Lash was my technician. Uh, and I, we had him doing a few things, but initially he was working uh, with some of the assembly operations, and we had to make little glass capillary tubes to bond the gold wires onto the transistors. We had a scheme where the, the gold wire was fed through the capillary, and then you heated it with a flame so it made a ball on the end, and then you push down the capillary, and it would stick to the metal. Anyhow, those tended to get plugged, so we needed a lot of capillaries. So we encouraged Art to go into business nights and evenings making capillaries to sell to Fairchild. And then he was helping me also with the furnaces we were designing. And those two products were the basis of the formation of Electric Glass Corporation. <laughs> Art finally made that a full-time job rather than continuing to work at Fairchild. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure companies developed uh, more or less like that during those early days. Anyhow, while we were making these first uh, MESA transistors, uh, completing the development of the process and putting them into production, uh, we had a person whose background was as a theoretician as part of the original group, by the name of Jean Herny. And particularly while we were setting up the initial equipment, uh, Jean was uh, writing in his notebook and coming up with ideas of things to try. And he came up with a proposal that uh, instead of making a mesa, which exposes the sensitive area of the transistor to the outside world, that one should just do more of these diffusions, oxide mass diffusions, and leave the oxide over the top of the junction, the sensitive part. Well, that's something that had previously been considered a bad idea because Bell Labs' uh, conventional wisdom was that the oxide was dirty and you wanted to get rid of it. But we couldn't try Jean's idea right away because it took four index masking operations in order to make the structure he was proposing. And Bob Noyce only bought three lenses. <laughs> so we couldn't make enough uh, uh, masks in order to make the full structure at first. So the, the idea lay dormant for Oh, well over a year, approaching two years, before we could get to the point where we could actually try it. And when we did, it turned out to work beautifully, that this protected the transistors in the regions where they were really sensitive. And that was a, a major step forward uh, that came out of Fairchild. In fact, uh, when I look at the development of the integrated circuit, I always measure it from the first planar transistor rather than from the first integrated circuit. Well, ICs today are built the same way, are they not? With That's the right. oxide layer? Yeah, it's very much the same technology today. Now, uh, when the patents for the planar transistor were being filed, uh, Noyce uh, was working with the, the patent attorney. And uh, the patent attorney suggested, now, have you looked at all the ramifications of this technology? And Bob, who was director of research and development at Fairchild at that time, went back. And, uh, actually had a, a meeting of the senior staff there. And during that meeting, uh, he invented the, the two things that were needed to go from the planar transistor to an integrated circuit. Uh, the idea of using thin film interconnections over the top of the silicon oxide, and the idea of using extra junctions in order to isolate one uh, transistor from another. And he came up with both of those during the same meeting. <laughs> So uh, wow. fortunately, we, we were really in the right path for the technology to do these things. Texas Instruments, uh, Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments, had already built an integrated circuit. But his was very much a laboratory device that was, had etch, etched 
uh, thin areas to make resistors. It had flying uh, wire bonds that uh, weren't really practical for anything like a production device. But the technology we had at Fairchild was the path to make the practical integrated circuit. Noyce and Kilby are often given credit as co-inventors of the integrated circuit. But what they contributed was dramatically different. Kilby made a laboratory model by uh, hook and crook. Noyce took the planar technology and extended it so you could make a complete structure using the material processing operations that we had developed. So you could cover a whole wafer with identical structures again and cut them apart. Which again is, is, is what is done today. Absolutely. This was the, the step along that path. So Fairchild really got a lot of that going. Well, at some point in time, you took over R&D and, and you built the uh, facility at uh, Palo Alto. Yeah, well, that's another story. Uh, to digress a bit, uh, when we uh, set up Fairchild, the first thing we knew was that uh, none of us had any experience at all in running a company. And we'd seen how difficult that was at Shockley. So we set out to hire our own boss. Uh, the eight of us went looking rather broadly uh, for a general manager to come in and run the company. We advertised in the Wall Street Journal uh, and looked around. And we found a fellow by the name of Ed Baldwin from uh, Hughes Semiconductor. He'd been engineering manager at Hughes. And he knew a lot of things about operating an enterprise that we didn't. So we hired Ed as our boss. Uh, Ed never really felt Fairchild was his company. Uh, you know, I still don't understand why. He came in very early. He had the same equity participation that the eight of the founders did, or at least he had access to it. In fact, he never put in his $500, so never got it. Uh, but. Uh, about a year after he arrived and after we'd put the first products into production, uh, he and several of the people he had brought in uh, announced one morning they were leaving and they went down the street and set up Ream Semiconductor. And uh, that was the time I became a director of R&D. Until that time, I had had a, a position responsible for engineering the new processes and products and putting them into production and the quality organization. And Bob Noyce had a parallel position running research and development, looking at new devices. Uh, when Ed left, the eight of us sat down uh, to discuss uh, what should we do? Should we go out and look for somebody else? And we decided after being betrayed by the first guy we brought in that uh, we would risk the fact that none of us knew much about running a business, although we knew more now than we had a year previously. And uh, decided that uh, Bob should become the general manager. Then I moved over and took the research and development responsibility. And I had that at Fairchild until I left in 1968. Well, under, uh, under your uh, leadership, there was a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, developments made. Well, Fairchild had the right technology at the time. And as a result, uh, I think uh, we were the most productive laboratory in the business for uh, about a decade there, at least. Uh, the integrated circuit developments uh, principally came out of there. We made more and more complex circuits, extended uh, the capability to linear circuits as well as the digital circuits. Uh, we did the basic work on making stable MOS devices. Some parallel work was done at RCA laboratories, uh, but uh, most of it uh, really came out of the Fairchild labs. Uh, one thing we did that uh, I don't think is generally recognized is uh, the first CMOS circuits were made there. In fact, uh, I remember this because my first trip to Europe in 1963 was to describe the advantages of CMO circuitry for low power electronics. I went to several uh, European countries with a, uh, a group edit, headed by Ed Kianjin that uh, was uh, under a, some kind of NATO sponsorship. Uh, there's a book on micropower electronics that came out of that. 
and there have been a tremendous number of variations on the technology since. But Fairchild really was in the right place at the right time. And not only did we have a lot of uh, technical contributions, that was a time period where it seems like every new idea that came along spawned uh, one to five new companies. Uh, it really was a, the period of time when the Silicon Valley effect of uh, all the spinoffs really blossomed. Uh, there's a genealogy chart that was Don Heffler published in a couple of editions that uh, shows a lot of the companies that uh, show their that can trace their origin back to Fairchild. Yeah, lots. Now, when when did you come up with Moore's law? Moore's law has been applied to a, 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 a one graph in an article I published in 1965. Uh, Electronics Magazine's 35th annual or 35th anniversary edition asked me to uh, predict the course of component technology for the next 10 years. And uh, I looked at what we had done in integrated circuits. Integrated circuits then were about four years old. Just gotten the, the first families out, and we're making some a bit more complex. And I looked at what was happening on those and saw that the number of components, the number of transistors or resistors, in an integrated circuit was about doubling every year. So I just took that and said, what's going to happen in components? And that's going to continue to happen for another 10 years. So things will be a thousand times as complex in 1975 as they were in 1965. And I think the most complex circuit we had around was 64 components mm -hmm. when I did this. So I was predicting 64,000 components in an integrated circuit by the mid-70s. And amazingly enough, we stayed almost exactly on that curve for 10 years. Did Carver Mead have anything to do with that, with his scaling work? Uh, no, I was completely independent. Uh, we've talked with, uh, I certainly have talked with Carver off and on, but uh, he wasn't involved at all in that prediction. Now, I modified that in 1975, uh, suggesting it was going to slow down to more like a doubling every two years. And I was a little bit too pessimistic then. We've actually beat that. It doubles something between 18 months and two years. Yes, and, and when, will, when will it approach the number of atoms in the universe? <laughs> Have you run uh, that I haven't extrapolated yet? it that far. <laughs> 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 That's one thing any exponential like that uh, <laughs> predicts a disaster if you extrapolate it far enough. Uh, one of, the, one of the questions that has come out of a, a number of, of, of lawsuits as of recently, that here on the West Coast in Silicon Valley, we didn't patent uh, circuit designs or computer-aided design for that matter. Uh, and as a result, we never patented at, at Fairchild the ROM and the RAM. Intel uh, never patented the microprocessor. Um, and, and others did. East Coast companies, or uh, TI in particular, took our work and patented it. And, uh, how, how come we never recognized the importance of that circuit development? Well, it was probably a, a different attitude about patents. Uh, one thing that happened in the semiconductor industry, uh, the semiconductor process is a, a long series of steps. And uh, the patents had gotten pretty broadly spread because all of the people working on the technology had some of them. And the net result was, uh, in order for any of us to operate, we had to be cross-licensed. So the participants tended to all cross-license one another. So there was not a tremendous advantage to having more patents, uh, in that, uh, with a couple of exceptions, there wasn't much uh, net benefit from it. Uh, what we never anticipated, I guess, was a lot of other participants were going to enter the business later on. Uh, so at Fairchild, we tended to patent uh, relatively few things, uh, typically the ones that uh, we thought we could police most easily and were most difficult to get around, you know, the more fundamental things. But uh, I was responsible for a lot of those decisions. I remember one in particular that, in retrospect, is kind of funny. The early days of the integrated circuit, Bob Norman, one of the people who was involved there, 
uh, suggested the idea of semiconductor memory, had the whole idea of how uh, semiconductor flip-flops could be used as a memory structure. And uh, I decided it was so economically ridiculous that it didn't make any sense to file a patent on it. You recognize that a few years later, semiconductor memory was the basis of what <laughs> we Intel. found at Intel. It <laughs> <laughs> shows how hard it is to predict what's going to be happening. And uh, it turns out that when I had answered this ad, they called me down to an interview in uh, New York City. And it was a hot, hot day in August. And uh, the interview room was a hotel room in this hotel. And uh, I got up there, and I'm perspiring, you know, because it's hotter than hell. And I walk in, and there are these two guys sitting around this table with all sorts of alcohol, you know, stacked up. And these guys were in great shape. You know, and it was around 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, one was the uh, HR uh, VP, and the other was the uh, VP of, uh, of manufacturing. And uh, we interviewed. And I hit it off with these guys, and we went to lunch, and had they, you know, got further bombed, and uh, they gave me a job offer for thirteen thousand dollars. I was making uh, seventy-two hundred, seventy-two hundred dollars a year. They offered me thirteen thousand. I accepted on the spot. And we came, I went home, told my wife. She was amazed that I'd want to leave the East Coast, and uh, we sold the house packed up the kids and drove to California. When I got out here and came to, uh, to the Fairchild at Wisman Road uh, facility, they didn't know me from Adam. They lost track of the fact that they'd offered me a job. And it was some time before they find, I finally got a hold of, uh, of Grady uh, and, and went over with them, you know, just exactly what happened when having it. They finally recognized that, yeah, they had given me a job offer. So they put me on the payroll, and they put me in a room along with the other guy that they had hired for the same job. Now, you, can you picture this? It's two production managers in the same office with one general foreman, who was this guy, Bob Ropes, that I mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, just complete chaos. There was no understanding of how to manage a, uh, a manufacturing organization, well, any kind of an organization. And that, that's a weakness and a positive, too, uh, in many ways, probably one of the reasons why it, the, uh, the organizations were so flexible, because they didn't have structure. But from a guy from GE, for, for, they'd been there at GE for nine years, it was a hell of a shock. Well, the, the uh, founders were all scientists, were they not, at Fairchild? Uh, Almost all of them. Julie Blank wasn't, and uh, and Gene Klein weren't. Gene Klein was a machinist, uh, probably more than a machinist. More, uh, he was a very high class machinist because he could teach mathematics and teach uh, 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 machine design. And Julie, uh, actually, Julie was an engineer, but did not work as a scientist. He was an engineer. He really worked more in the uh, plant engineering kinds of uh, functions. But the rest of them were, and I mean, the, you're right. The 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 operation was run by people who were, uh, you know, scientists. Gordon and Jay Last and Bob Noyce, et cetera. So how was this uh, resolved? I was only uh, there a couple of weeks, and the other guy disappeared, and uh, I think he just got disgusted and quit. I didn't have any choice. I sold, I cut the limb off, you know, behind me, so I had to stick it out. Actually, it was a, it was a very fortunate that I did. So were, were you really one of the first of the semiconductor uh, manufacturing people? Yeah, the rest of the, uh, when you looked at Fairchild, well, first, first of all, Fairchild was the, the, the first we're talking about Silicon Valley here, before it was called Silicon Valley. Uh, if you talk about that area, um, Fairchild certainly was the first semiconductor facility went into manufacturing at all, because Shockley was the only operation prior to that, and they never really got to a manufacturing mode. Um, the 
the other thing about that, in many ways, was very fortunate for, for me. There was nobody in the operation who had manufacturing experience. Uh, or if they did, they had experience, manufacturing experience in California in sort of a military kinds of environments. So uh, I think I was very fortunate to arrive at the scene when the, <coughs> excuse me, and the company needed uh, manufacturing capability and there was no one else around who really had extensive uh, manufacturing background. And there was no semiconductor equipment uh, sector oh, in those days. Oh, yeah, everything was being made, uh, you know, especially for, uh, for uh, you know, silicon diffused uh, junction devices. I mean, it's, uh, there was equipment, you know, fairly sophisticated equipment being used at various uh, other types of uh, products in the East Coast, like at Philco or maybe even a Motorola and a TI, a Transitron, what have you, all these companies. That, but uh, for the product that uh, Fairchild was building, was, you, know, you had to go out and buy a laboratory uh, diffusion furnace and modify it. You had to uh, build your own pullers, you know, for uh, the ingot puller. And um, and the all the, the step and repeat, you know, Bob Noyce built his own step and repeat camera, the first one that they used. There was uh, one of the geniuses of these people, is that yeah, they were they were scientists, they were uh, doctors in physics, what have you. But God, they could get down at the basic level and build stuff, and do it, you know, fast. There's this great story that Tom Bay tells. Of uh, he, you know, Tom Bay was the first marketing manager at Fairchild, and he uh, joined uh, about three or four months after they started, after they'd broken away from sh from Shockley and and were starting to set up shop. And he had read in one of the um, aerospace. Uh, magazines that the IBM Owego, which was you know a military branch of the IBM at the time, that they were looking for a core driver. But they were converting, they had the, gotten the contract to convert B-52, uh, the, the B-52 electronic system, I can't remember exactly what the particular system was, from vacuum tubes to solid state. They had gotten the contract to do this. And they were looking for this core driver. And uh, he and Bob went back to visit IBM. And they, uh, IBM described, you know, what they needed. They needed, uh, it was very important for them to meet the uh, military temperature issues, uh, which was a problem for what they were using, because they were using uh, either germanium or attempting a germanium in one of the uh, TI devices, um, and they needed certain uh, uh, speed and what have you. So Bob said, "We can do that." Now you understand they had never they hadn't designed their first transistor yet, and they had he didn't really know except he did know. I mean he had this gut feeling of what they could do and what they couldn't do. So they said, "We'll do it." And they took a, a contract. The first contract Fairchild got was for 150 bucks for, I don't know, 300 of these or some damn thing. And uh, just before they left, he turned, Bob turned to uh, the uh, purchasing guy there, and he said, uh, uh, before we leave, uh, which do you want? You want NPN or PNP? And IBM you know, said, it doesn't matter to us. We can, we can live with either. You tell us what it's going to be, and we'll live with that. So they left. And that, that meeting occurred in October of, uh, oh God, no, it had to be 57. And uh, they were supposed to deliver shortly after the, uh, you know, the first of the year. And they didn't have a plant yet. I mean, they had a building, but they didn't have any. They came out, as Tom says, I mean, they were still sweeping the floor. 
they went ahead and they built uh, furnaces, they built a puller, they built the, put the, the uh, assembly equipment in. The Greenwich did the test, uh, you know, how they were going to test the stuff, and they, they went down two parallel paths, an NPN, a PNP. Gordon Moore was assigned to NPN, and Jean Ernie the PNP. And uh, they worked like hell. And they, uh, it turns out that the PNP, as you know, is more, much more difficult product, especially in those days, to build. And John had run into a lot of yield problems, and the, P and the NPN came through. Uh, they delivered that 100 units in March, starting from scratch, scratch at design and scratch at factory. And it's the only reason they were able to do that is, of course, everything, the, the equipment was very rudimentary, but also these guys were just very good in all ways. In a way, it, <clears throat> it's kind of a model of a modern startup where, you know, internet speed and... Yeah. Because uh, uh, industry wasn't that way. American industry was not that way no, at the time. Was, and, but that's what it took. You know, it's why there were damn few, if any, of the conventional classic uh, old line companies ever made it in the semiconductor business. I mean, all these guys were in it, and GE and so on, but they never made it. Never were successful. But they're an interesting guy. You know, it's easy to talk about Gordon, about uh, Gordon too. But I, Bob Noyes. The interesting thing about Bob, we were very close, uh, family-wise, and he'd come down, you know, on Sunday afternoon with his family, and we'd barbecue and what have you. And this one day, this one weekend, I had started building a uh, a barbecue pit. You know, with a with a deal that would the the uh, the grate could be raised and lowered with a crank and what have you, and I got involved in building a thing and I ran into an impasse and I couldn't see how I was going to you know build my uh, barbecue pit the the brick it was made of bricks uh, properly to get to the stage I wanted to get to, and he says just a few minutes I'm going to go back and get my mortar equipment he goes back up and he brings his you know, tools down, and you know, he goes to work like a mason, and you know, he solved that problem, finished the uh, the barbecue that uh, weekend, and that was Bob Noyes. I'm just unbelievable talent in any direction you want to, uh, you know, look at. Interesting people, all of them. And guys. a nice guy too. Oh, he was a charmer, real charmer. He was a charmer for the ladies too, you know. It's, like a lot of us would love, would love to be, he was. Well, anyway, uh, so what happened at Fairchild? Did you build up the uh, capacity and the production? Yeah, that was, I joined in, uh, in uh, October of 59, and uh, we had very little volume at that time. So everything w had to do with uh, increasing volume, increasing yields. Yields were terrible. Probably the the thing that that allowed us to really go to big volume and solve the yield problems and eliminate this kind of a step was the uh, the uh, invention of the uh, the planar uh, process. And uh, you know, I always felt that the reason Jean Erny came up with that is because he had been unsuccessful at the effort in, in, in sort of in competition with uh, Gordon on the NPN, or the PNP uh, effort, that the company did not pick that to be the first chip. And it bothered uh, Jean, and Jean was one of these very emotional uh, characters, tremendously talented, but very emotional too. And he worked very hard at uh, continuing to push the a PNP, but also in, in terms of eliminating the reasons why he was getting a lousy yield, which, you know, ultimately or, you know, drove in the direction of somehow protecting that junction, which is what the planar process does, is protect the junction. But once the, the planar uh, a process was developed, uh, boy, yields just skyrocketed, and uh, of course, as you know, it, it allowed uh, all sorts of great things to happen in the industry, what, like, like the integrated, like called integrated circuit. circuits, right? Yes. Yeah. 
I think one of the, uh, the uh, you talked about production. There's another interesting issue that that uh, that developed that had major impact upon the the industry, you know, across the world. Is that um, after we started, it was still at the transistor level, we were, but we were using planar uh, devices. We were producing uh, significant numbers of them, but we were running into limitations as to where we could sell the product. Um, the, uh, the problem really was that uh, the bulk of our product was going into the military and to a much lesser extent to uh, the computer business. But there was this vast consumer market out there and the, and the bulk of the computer market. But we didn't have prices low enough to participate there, really because of our assembly cost. As you realize, you know, you're building one at a time transistor. It's, uh, and these things were not heavily automated either, either at the time. And we looked at this issue. Uh, labor cost was the predominant item for our cost of building transistors. And uh, cost, uh, the availability and the cost in the Bay Area was a, was a problem. So first we started looking, I started looking elsewhere in the country. That's why we located a plant in, in Portland, Maine. But that didn't really solve the problem. So. Uh, one of the guys had been traveling around the world, and he happened to have stopped in uh, Hong Kong. And Bob Noyce had a, an investment in a radio company in, in, uh, in Hong Kong. This was like 1962. A fail, failing radio company, it was. And uh, this guy came back, and he says, you know, we got to look at Hong Kong. So I and Julie Blank went over to Hong Kong, and we became convinced that by God, we could assemble these devices here, especially now we have planar chips, which were excused a lot of problems, planar uh, chips did. So we set up a factory there, and that's where that all started. It's, uh, you know, in, it was originally driven by labor costs, and then secondly, it turns out, overhead costs. It just was a mad rush into Southeast Asia by all companies eventually. Well. Uh did you uh, also go to Shiprock, New Mexico, to the Indian Reservation? Yeah, that's not one of the... Uh, I, I noticed you didn't bring that up. No, it, uh, we did. That was the, uh, a, just about the time we went to, to uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, uh, Portland, uh, Maine. We looked elsewhere, and Shiprock uh, was a, uh, looked like a possibility, and we did locate down there. It never worked out. Though. It was a... Uh, we were really screwing up the whole societal structure of the Indian tribe. You know, the, the women were making money, and the, the guys were drinking it up. And it, it was, I mean, we had a very major negative impact upon uh, the Navajo tribe. Well, now, you developed the uh, silicon gate, the first uh, practical, yes. usable silicon gate process. That's correct, yeah. That, was, uh, that was the first project. In fact, when I joined, the lab, I was given the choice of two things to do. One was a, was a circuit design, uh, a shift register using metal gate technology. Uh, I think it was a 100 or 200 bit shift registers. And, uh, and the other alternative that I had was to develop uh, a process technology using polysilicon as the uh, gate electrode of, uh, of the transistors. And, uh, and I, I recognized immediately the advantages of using polysilicon. And I decided I picked that one, even if my heart was leaning more and more toward, even in those days, toward design. And so, so I picked that. And uh, uh, Tom Klein had done some prior work to show that, uh, that uh, in fact, the work function uh, between the, the polysilicon and, and silicon would work out in such a way that that the threshold voltage would be lower, which was a big advantage in those days because uh, we could not control uh, uh, QSS and, and, and as well as we can today. Um, but there was no ways of doing it. In fact, even etching polysilicon was not, was not understood how to do it. Um, and so I started from scratch. I started from, from uh, the basic idea that how 
you know, how could one make an integrated circuit using polysilicon. And I developed the basic architecture of the process. I started doing the, uh, uh, the uh, I developed the etching solution for etching reliably uh, um, polysilicon. And uh, using some existing test patterns that were there, shown that, mm -hmm. that in fact, uh, uh, we could produce uh, workable transistors within a few months that, that I started. Um, I also invented the, uh, the buried, what, what is called the buried contact, which is the, the polysilicon to, to silicon uh, um, uh, contact, which uh, uh, was in fact later on was the one that allowed us to make the microprocessor so, so quickly, so soon, because it would allow to have much more dense circuitry uh, uh, than, than was possible with metal gate. So by April, we had the basic process technology worked out. And then I designed the first integrated circuit to use the uh, uh, silicon gate technology, which was the 3708. It was an 8-bit analog multiplexer using uh, the decoding logic. It was housed in a 16-pin package. And it was a product that was particularly difficult to do uh, in manufacturing. It was already a product that was called 3705. It was in the catalog uh, uh, of products of Fairchild. It was sold mostly to military uh, uh, applications. And uh, because they, they had the uh, ohm resistance of these transistors had to be very low, it had to be fast, and the leakage had to be extremely low, it was very difficult to make. And, uh, and so we picked that device as a test bed for the technology. And, uh, and eventually, uh, in 69, we were in production with that in, in, the, in the lab. And, uh, so that became the first, the first commercial silicon gate technology product. Well, I had no interest in leaving um, Motorola for a company named Fairchild in Northern California. And, uh, but I agreed to an interview on the proviso that it could be over a weekend. And my plan, quite simply, was to spend a weekend in California after a brief interview. Well, you know, uh, sometimes reality mugs you. I got out there, and I was frankly blown away by the caliber of the people. Just some incredibly great people. Sales manager was a guy named Don Rogers. Uh, marketing manager was a guy named Tom Bay. These guys were super smart guys. And they introduced me to another uh, feisty little guy who was running a diode operation called John Reddy, who, you know, just couldn't tell me enough about how great this company was. And he didn't have to tell me. I was a smart guy. I figured it out. And then I met Bob Noyce, and my world changed. This was the smartest man I'd ever met in my life. He was congenial, you know, he was engaging, and he was just so smart. And uh, we talked about the things they were doing, and I thought to myself, gosh, I just really have to go to work for this company. So that was the end of my um, playing around in California for the weekend. Instead, I went into my mode of how do I get a job with these guys where I wanted to be. So what they really wanted me to do was be a sales engineer in the Chicago area, basically calling on the same customers where I'd been so effective for their competitor. And they were quite blown away when I said, well, I'll accept the job, but it's got to be in Southern California. And again, I said, this is the place I want to live, and didn't think a lot more about it. But once I got to, uh, anyway, I got the job. Uh, I left Motorola. This was in early 61. And my life has just been incredibly great since then. From 61 through 68, uh, I was just thrilled with what was going on in our industry. We were changing the world. Fairchild had invented the uh, silicon planar transistor. They had invented the monolithic integrated circuit. Uh, Bob Noyce uh, was there for any bright, young employee to talk to. The rest of the, the team was motivated highly to be number one in the industry. And it was just a wonderful period of time as we were inventing new things opening new markets. I remember uh, there was a guy named Newton Minow, who was at the time the head of the FCC. And he mandated that all TV sets had to have UHF. Well, this was a big deal back in those days, in the 60s. Up to there was only a few channels, 1 through 13. And half of those were just static. But all of a sudden, you had to have UHF. So every TV had to have a UHF tuner. Well, to have a UHF tuner, you need a very high frequency oscillator. Well, Fairchild had a transistor. The 1211, how's that? The uh, 1211, the 2N 1211. And it was a dynamite transistor. And so from that uh, technology, uh, we went out. We we're going to go sell these things against an RCA New Vista. 
RCA New Vista was a solid state device, sort of, but it still had a cathode, and so it had a lifetime as opposed to a, uh, or a limited lifetime as opposed to a transistor, which in theory was infinitely, was, had an infinite lifetime. So I went out there, and the only problem was that uh, this device that we were selling, and I, I said it was the 2N1211, that's a mistake. It was the 2N918. 1211 was the internal technology number. So the 2N918 um, sold for $150. Well, since they were looking for a product for about a buck <laughs> for this uh, device, that was kind of a, a, a setback for us. But I had this great conversation with Bob Noyce and Tom Bay at Bob Noyce's house. And of course, by this time, you know, Bob was already a wealthy and successful fellow and a beautiful home. And uh, we met on a weekend and offered me a beer. And I never drank beer, never, didn't want to drink, didn't want to cloud my mind. And we started talking about this, and I said, you know, the, the, I think we can sell this product, but you know, they can only afford to spend uh, uh, you know, less than two dollars, you know, and uh, they have to see a way to get down below a dollar. So Bob proceeded to tell me about what they were doing about shrinking the technology, and of course, we've learned since then that that's what's the magic of semiconductors. You just keep building smaller and smaller feature sizes, driving the cost down. And he said, let's just do it. We're going to open a plant in Hong Kong, and we're going to put these things in plastic, and they'll be cheap, and we can just do it. Well, I was blown away, and I went out there, and uh, in my role as, in my title was a great title at the time, Director of Entertainment Sales. It sounded like I was selling booking agents or something, but I was actually calling on consumer customers, TV, radio, stereo, as Fairchild was moving from being in the, uh, primarily in the uh, military electronics uh, supply chain to uh, consumer and uh, industrial. So is, uh, I guess the point I'd like to make with that was it just showed that uh, there was nothing we couldn't do. You know, later on, you know, uh, Thomas Wolfe wrote about uh, Masters of the Universe, but he didn't have it right. The Masters of the Universe weren't the guys who were selling uh, stocks and bonds on Wall Street. We were the Masters of the Universe. We were changing the world. Semiconductor technology was going to let you do things you could never do before and make them available everywhere. So it wasn't very long, and for us today, I mean, nobody even thinks anything about you know UHF channels. Now we've got 600 cable channels or satellite channels, but it all started, you know, with uh, an innovative company, Fairchild Semiconductor, with new technology, and a marketing drive to uh, change the world. And uh, it was a wonderful place to work, but it had a character flaw, and uh, the character flaw was called Syosset, Long Island. And that's where Fairchild Cameron Instrument was headquartered, and they were the owner of Fairchild Semiconductor. And all the cash flow and all the money that was being made was flowing into their pockets and being dissipated on uh, not such great other activities. Meanwhile, the uh, contributors at Fairchild weren't making very much money particularly. But worse than that, as I got to the end of my uh, time there, the company was being starved for capital investment. And so we couldn't even afford to buy the testers to ensure that we were meeting the specifications. I remember losing business at RCA, of all places, because uh, we were supplying them a current mode logic device we developed, an integrated circuit, a microchip. We couldn't guarantee the quality because we didn't have enough testers to uh, test all the parts. And uh, it was grim. And I thought this was a tragic situation for a company. And I'd remind you that at the time, Texas Instruments was already a giant company when Fairchild got started. And Fairchild got started in 57, as I recall. Uh, 58, Bob Noyce invented the integrated circuit, the monolithic integrated circuit. I joined in 61. But by 67 and 68, we were in a serious retreat because, as I say, having won the Minuteman program away from TI with our new technology and our innovation, we were, we, we'd lost the second go around to a, a TI approach, which was the wrong approach. But because we didn't really have the uh, support of corporate back in Syosset, we didn't have the capital being invested to, not to mention uh, the reward to the innovators. So it was a sad time, and Fairchild began to decline, and people started to leave. Um, I was in LA, and I, I was probably, um, no, not probably, I was the only knowledgeable electrical engineer at Fairchild who was a, uh, um, in, in the applications and the marketing organizations, who was a legitimate design engineer in analog, who, who understood gain phase relationships and, and amplifiers and, 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 and basically equipment. And um, 
Vic Greenwich had some background in that area, uh, which, but, but there were not a lot of other guys. And uh, it turned out that Bob Weidler, I was in LA, and Bob Weidler had joined um, uh, Fairchild from uh, Ball Brothers. He was a very background, very similar to me. He was working for an equipment company, Ball Brothers. I think he'd gone, out, gone to the University of Colorado. And they were in Colorado, and I had worked at uh, this electronic specialties in LA. And we both left our companies to go to Fairchild. And, and Bob somehow got into Fairchild R&D. But he didn't have uh, the typical R&D degrees that all these guys had. He, he had a bachelor's <laughs> degree out of, out of University of Colorado. And you, Rob, you know, they had a very pedigreed organization in R&D. And, and, um, and he was very much a radical. Uh, and they, uh, maybe even some people say not altogether stable. But, uh, but he was very aggressive. And uh, he made uh, a relationship with a fellow by the name of Dave Talbert, who was a process engineer working in, in Mountain View in the, in, the, in the Wafer Fab area. And I don't know what they hired Bob Weidler to do in R&D. I can't imagine even Gordon Moore or Pierre Lamar hiring him. But somebody hired him. And, but it made no difference what they wanted him to do. What he decided he was going to do was um, design an amplifier. And, and apparently, they had tried to design some amplifiers using these digital processes that they had. And they, it was not possible, because the breakdown voltages weren't there. They didn't have an epitaxial material that could give them any breakdown voltages. The leakage were, were terrible. They had no PNP transistors. Um, and so Bob got together with Dave Talbert. Um, and they, they both were heavy drinkers, very young. But, and, they would, and Bob Weiler talked Dave Talbert into moonlighting. Uh, and developing a process that he could, he could build an amplifier with. And this was all done while Bob Dave, Dave Talbert was, was literally working uh, his day job, was running uh, uh, as a process engineer working in a digital line at, at, at Mountain View. And um, between Weidler and Dave Talbert, they developed this, this process that, that would give them, uh, initially, it would give them, uh, I think, about 25 volt breakdowns. They eventually took it, got it up to where it would give them about 35 volt breakdowns had a lateral PNP uh, uh, that had a beta of 0.5. It was just <laughs> it really terrible. But, but it was all done without any Fairchild sponsorship whatsoever or knowledge. And, and the story's going to go on for a little bit, but it's really a great story. So, so unbeknownst to uh, any of the management at Fairchild, Bob Weidler, who is a, a bachelor's degree junior engineer at, at Fairchild R&D, has this amplifier that he's developed. And uh, uh, he. He doesn't tell anybody about it, uh, but he does find a way to expose it to uh, a few of the Fairchild salespeople. And the two guys he exposed it to were Floyd Kwame, who, had, who was calling on IBM at the time, and, and me, which w because he had determined that we both were technically knew what we were doing and, and we understood him. And he brought it, gave us samples, and we started you know, showing this th these things to people. And, I mean, and the reaction was phenomenal because it would reduce the board, the board sizes. You know, every, most of the computing that was done in the defense industry in those days was done fundamentally with analog computing. And, and so this thing was a, a huge uh, uh, advantage to reducing size and weight. So there was a lot of customer interest. And, 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 and because of this, the, the management at Fairchild found out about it. I mean, they heard about it. And they, they, they what is this thing? What is this? This uh, 702 amp. What is this? You know, what is this product? And they 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 uh, they found out that this guy Bob Weidler had uh, designed it, and uh, it was being built at Fairchild, and and there was enough market interest, very much, a lot of interest that that, um, that Tom Bay and uh, Bob Noyce decided that uh, they would we ought to sell this thing. So they go to they go to Bob Weidler. Now this is all occurring in about 1965. They go to Bob Weidler and, and they 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 introduce themselves. They literally didn't know him. Introduce themselves to him. Tell him, you know, of course he knows who they are. And they said, you know, we're gonna, you know, uh, you, you know, you're, this product, this circuit you designed, we're gonna make it a Fairchild product. We're gonna announce this thing, and uh, you know, we'll we'll sell it. And and he he said, the hell you are. And they said, what do you mean? Said, you're not gonna you're not gonna sell this. You guys don't know anything about this product. Nobody in this company knows anything about it. You you can't sell this. He says, I don't want you to sell it. You, you, you don't know how to. You know you don't know anything about it. It's, that conversation went on, and the fact is, Weidler refused to cooperate. And, and they and they walked away, and they, they shaking their head. He, nobody tell this kid telling these guys. 
and they just were irate, as you, you could remember how they could get. And, um, and they were just, they would have killed him, but they, that would have been like killing the golden goose. <laughs> this product was hot. And, uh, and Weiler's selling them. They, they got no business uh, you know, with it. They don't know anything about it. They didn't, uh, because he had been rejected many, many times by all, and, and he was an outcast. So he was, he had a reason to be upset and be arrogant, and, but, he, but he, he insisted that they, he wasn't gonna do it. So they would go back to him another time and they tell him, you know, they say, well, listen, you know, what, do you, what, would, what would make it, what, what would come make you comfortable with us being able to properly represent the product? And he said, well, you've got to get, you know, you have to have an organization that, that understands these things. You have to, have, and he said, well, if we give you a, if we put a, a, a product manager in charge of it that, that is, you know, that, you, that you're comfortable with, would you be okay then? And he said, yeah. I get this call from Bob Graham, and, you know, I'm happy as a duck down there doing what I'm doing. I get this call. I have no, I've been there a year. I have no reason to expect to get promoted or anything. I get this call from Bob Graham. And he says, uh, Jack, uh, who was running all the product marketing, he says, uh, come on up. Uh, we want to we want you to interview for a job. Uh, you're going to be the linear circuit product manager. And I went, wow. So I, you know, I go up there, and they bring me. Uh, we get to move up there in about two weeks, and I, uh, I they they walk me over. I get this office, and nice office, big off, big for me. I had no office. It was the first office I'd ever had in my life, and I just began. Uh, building a very competent analog organization at Fairchild, which ended up becoming the most competent in the world. I hired guys like Mike Scott, who was at National. I hired Mike Markula, Gene Carter. Um, you know, we had about eight or nine of us, and, and we, at one time, had 80% of the market. And so for a, a couple of years, we, we did that. And my job continued to be, they didn't fire me, they, they, I, they did well. But my, a major one of my responsibilities was babysitting Bob Weidler. And uh, he would almost talk to nobody, and he would only talk to me on a K, you know, if I could get him in the right mood. And he was still secretive as hell. And uh, it, so, you know, and then Bob hired Jim Giles, and uh, Dave Fulligar was over at Fairchild R&D. He'd come out of uh, Transitron, and Dave, uh, uh, and then the story goes on and on, but Bob, uh, Bob eventually uh, left to found uh, National Semiconductor. Uh, he and Dave Talbert were the, really the founders of National Semiconductor, and then Charlie Spork joined them later. But Bob uh, left, and I remember Weidler tell him, telling me, you know, uh, he and Talbert for the first six months literally built an epi reactor. I mean, the two of them. I mean, it was like ground, you know, ground zero. You didn't go buy anything, and Weidler and Talbert actually built one. and. Uh, and then after they started making some linear circuits, uh, Charlie and Pierre and these other guys, you know, came over. But um, but when when Bob Weidler left, then uh, I pretty much became the 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 guy in charge of all of the analog effort at at at, uh, at Fairchild. And and uh, Dave Talbert, Jim Giles, moved over, you know, to to replace Bob Weidler, and we ran that operation for about another three years, two or three years, and then I left and founded uh, Advanced Micro Devices. Another time we're, we're at the wagon, this is the wagon wheel, which is where we always went. Um, I, I walk in there and, and Bob Weiler's got one of my guys, Mike Scott, who ended up going to National. Did you know Mike Scott? Okay, Mike went, went to National and ended up doing a great job and then was the CEO of, uh, of Apple Computer. But when I hired Mike, I hired him out of Beckman Instruments and he was a, just a very uncouth, uh, inexperienced young man, and we had a, you know, bright as hell, aggressive, uh, overweight. Um, uh, he's from Caltech, and so we, Mike Mark and I, would you know spend a great deal of time trying to teach him, you know, literally how to eat with a knife and fork at times. I mean, that's how crude, crude he was, but but he was um, committed to succeed and, and 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 a nice kid. And and one night I, I walked in the wagon wheel, and here Bob Weidler has him over. You know, at the bar, that it was a rail bar like this, and 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 Weiler's just harassing him. Uh, I mean, just just incessantly, and and um, and so uh, and, and Weiler liked to fight and thought he could fight, pretty, and and, um, and so finally, uh, you know, he just uh, tells Mike Scott, you know, they're they're going to fight, they're going to go out in the parking lot and fight. So they go out. About 15 minutes later, Mike Scott comes in. 
<laughs> Weiler didn't. I mean, it was Mike Little's kid, Mike Scott, just absolutely clocked Weiler. I mean, it was like that was the end of Bob Weiler harassing Mike Scott. I'll, uh, you know, that was a, that was that was good for all of us when that happened. I have an interesting story about him. yeah. That when the, we opened the Fairchild Research Laboratory on the Stanford campus, uh, Sherman came out for that, and um, uh, Gordon and Bob Noyce and I uh, took Sherman to dinner at a restaurant down here in Atherton on the El Camino Real. And um, in came uh, no, Cherry Sanders, with two, who was at that time the sales manager responsible for the IBM account, which was one of our major customers, Fairchild's major customers. Sure. And Jerry, being his usual ebullient self, thought, gee, it'd be mice if these two salesmen or purchasing the people met Sherman Fairchild after all who was the director and yeah. the chairman of the living Academy. legend yeah right so I said sure Jerry come on over and join us for dinner and so they did and Jerry Sanders had never met Sherman Fairchild before but that didn't stop him he said Sherman said I think we're dating the same girl <laughs> well these two IBM <laughs> fellows wanted to <laughs> crawl under the table <laughs> And Noyce and Moore sort of looked at me, but Sherman brought out his little black book <laughs> and said, oh, the secretary out of Republic Aviation. We said, that's the one. And they talked about her, and then we got back talking about IBM. But that's the kind of, he was that easy man to get along with, Sherman Fairchild. <laughs> that had got to have shocked. How old was he at that time? Who? Uh, Sherman. 70s, early 70s, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That had to have shocked the uh, IBM Well, they people. just didn't know what to do. I mean, they were <laughs> classical black suit, white. And uh, <laughs> Jerry Sanders has heard me tell this tale before, and he's not always very fond of it. But anyway, it's a true story. <laughs> that, is, that is fantastic. At that time, they were having these big meetings, and I have a a verbatim transcript here of a, of a meeting that occurred at Fairchild that uh, caused Fairchild to get into the LSI business. I call it the LSI story. It's dated September 8th, 1967. And the attendees at the meeting were Bob Noyce, Tom Bay, Gordon Moore, uh, Dr. Bob Seeds that uh, John mentioned a minute ago, Jerry Sanders, Jerry Larkin, Maurice O'Shea, Bob Schreiner, John Sentus, and John Hume. And it's a very interesting story, uh, talking about gate arrays, which people thought was gate arrayed uh, at the time, because we'd never, nobody had ever heard of an array of gates that could be connected together to perform any digital logic function that you want. And uh, Maurice had uh, curves that showed that the number of these gate arrays was going to go off into the sky, and no, hardly anybody believed that at the time. Uh, I think it turned out to be true. Uh, it was an exponential growth. But the interesting thing about that is that all the discussion that went on in this 78-page uh, document resulted in Bob Noyce making the decision to start this department with uh, Bob Schreiner as the department head and uh, working for Bob Seeds at uh, Fairchild R&D. And the R&D department, R&D division, of course, was run by Gordon Moore. And that decision was made, and the department was started, and then. Uh, Shortly after that, we all, a bunch of us, moved up to R&D. Uh, we tackled such problems as uh, how one makes small quantities of quite complex circuits economically, and came up with uh, both of the approaches that have proven to be useful, the standard cell approach and the gate array approach at that time. Well, neither of those became uh, practical uh, applications while I was still at Fairchild. Uh, subsequently, they have become. Yes. Uh, uh, you find that 1980 at LSI Logic is a clone of what we did at Fairchild <laughs> <laughs> with, with a more modern uh, semiconductor technology, to be sure. But the techniques uh, uh, at Fairchild, we developed a, a logic simulation about place and route. We developed VLSI testers, mm -hmm. which later became the Sentry series. So all that was done uh, under your leadership. So 
I can remember Schreiner asking me, do you want to go uh, on the MOS side or the bipolar side? And I said, well, what's MOS? And <laughs> well, I, I knew a little bit about it from the device physics course, but uh, I said, I'll try that. You know, it sounds like fun. And that was kind of a watershed decision. And that's how I got into it. Well, the, 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 the Gatorade version never really worked. No, it didn't. The, uh, in, the, in the MOS case, it was a, it was a pre-diffused set of uh, 80 gates and uh, it was customized by two layers of metal. And all of that could be done. What wasn't uh, accomplished at that time was to make stable MOS devices. And so with the two-layer metal process, they were all hopelessly unstable. And uh, uh, there were so many ions going through. People hadn't learned how to get her yet uh, and do other things to make them stable. And so they, uh, basically, it never worked. And ultimately, I got frustrated at that and said, you know, to Schreiner and Videz, isn't there something else that I can do? And we started playing around with this standard cell concept. And that was the first uh, standard cell? I think so. Well, there was, there was a, uh, an effort or there was a description of an effort at NSA, I think, at that time. They were talking about doing standard cells. But I, uh, I don't know if they had implemented anything. Certainly, uh, you know, ours was the first implementation out here. And it worked. And it worked. It worked well. well can you show us your, your, your book from 1966? Sure. Uh, this, this book from 1966 is the handbook for the micro matrix, which was the pre-diffused pattern. And uh, this, this shows the two layers of interconnect and the bonding pads. And you can see the date on here is 1966. I joined in February of 66, and this is in uh, November, October of 1966, sorry. Um, one of the things that we did here, and I've got some extra papers in here. One of the things that we did in this technology was to uh, not only describe how we did the circuits, and I'll show some of the functions here, which are similar to the building blocks that are made today. I can find one. Like so. Different cell structures, and then the metal interconnect pattern that would accomplish that function, and so on, different cell uh, structures. Uh, but besides having the design, the design approach, we also had, in those days, a breadboarding approach. No, no longer do people do this sort of thing, but we would actually print out the two-layer interconnect system that, that we had for creating the cells and interconnecting them, and then populate a PC board like this with 80 metal cans of transistors, uh, I'm sorry, of gates, and then uh, yellow wire it to uh, plug it into a, an exerciser to test it. This was really pre-simulation, logic simulation. Pre-logic simulation. Uh, what we could do, though, at that time was to prove out the test sequence. There was a test, you really can't see much here, but this is a flow diagram of how we go about creating a test pattern, um, te a sequence of test patterns to exercise that bit of logic. And this would be ready by virtue of the, the uh, PC board mock-up or, or breadboard prior to the integrated product coming out. These worked, but unfortunately, the two-layer metal devices didn't work, or at least they didn't work for very long. So uh, you were recruited to Fairchild. Right. And uh, what, was, what was the task that? Well, the task was basically to continue um, and to extend what, what we had started at IBM. Uh, the graphic display project there had gotten some notoriety, and there definitely was interest on the part of Gordon Moore and Bob Seeds, who worked for him, as you know, uh, yourself, Rex Rice, in continuing to work on that sort of, um, that sort of a system. Uh, we had actually developed a system at IBM to lay out integrated circuits. It was only to lay out these these circuit modules or packages, as you might call them. And we wanted to really get serious about developing a system that would, uh, would do integrated circuits. Um, 
Clearly, we needed a graphical display that was something other than um, you know, a used radar set. So we set out to design a from the ground up graphical display uh, that would allow us to uh, really have the complex images that would be required for even the integrated circuits of the day. So that was the first project that we really set out to do. And in fact, we did that. Um, uh, we developed, we uh, worked with another vendor and developed this rather complex display that, uh, that uh, we programmed to uh, actually be used in the layout of integrated circuits. Uh, I wasn't as involved in that project, actually, as I had been in the previous project, because something else happened. Uh, but I was still a member of the group and worked alongside um, the people who, uh, who actually uh, were doing the programming of that. It was a gentleman named Steve Zucker who uh, actually did most of the programming. And in fact, uh, that work was reported in Scientific American. There was a Scientific American paper on that project uh, a few years later. Um, the, 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 the thing that sort of diverted me was I was still very much interested in this problem of how do you communicate a complex design to the computer. And not long after I got to Fairchild, uh, I think Hugh Mays walked in one day and laid a paper on my desk that was written by a gentleman named Ulrich, who was at North American Aviation, on logic simulation. And I had thought years before that it might be interesting to simulate the operation of a, uh, of a, uh, of a circuit on the computer, because again, it fit with my vision of having uh, uh, interacting with the computer to put a per correct description of a circuit in there. But um, computer simulation was a field that I was only peripherally involved with, and it was really being applied in very different areas, uh, uh, in no defense work and some other areas that were quite different from what we needed. Anyway, this fellow at North American Aviation had addressed the explicit problem of logic simulation, that is the simulation of the logical operation of a computer-like circuit. And um, I gobbled his paper up in an hour. I mean, I was so, you know, so interested in it. And suddenly I realized that in this simulation technique lay the key because you could have an engineer enter a circuit into one of these programs, and then he would work with the computer and actually simulate the operation of that circuit. But now remember, he's not working on the actual circuit, he's working on a computer model of it. So once he's satisfied with the way this simulated, simulation behaves, two things have been achieved. You've, the computer has now captured a description of the circuit, and at least insofar as the engineer knows, it is correct because he's checked it out on the computer. So I charged off and, and started writing, which I think was probably Silicon Valley's first logic simulator, which you named, Rob. You know it very well. It's called FairSim. And uh, we worked together on that, I guess, for five or six years. And uh, we created the, the, the what, it, what you would now call a front-end EDA environment. So you can enter a circuit, you could simulate it, and I built this language called simulated control, simulation control language where you could actually put pulses on it and clocks and check out the behavior of it. And, uh, and then you would be sure that it was correct and you had a, had a, uh, a good description in the computer. Uh, the other thing that we did, at least I think we tried to do, and this was probably some of your influence, is rather than create some exotic new circuit family or exotic new engineering technique, we tried to make this simulator as familiar as possible to people who were already designing circuits. As you know, the, the prevalent method for designing these circuits would be to breadboard them. You'd go build a wire wrap breadboard and, and you'd plug in discrete components that behaved in the same way that the, the components you wanted to put on your chip would behave, and then you'd wire this thing up and then you'd operate it physically. And I was going to replace all that with simulation, but what I didn't want to replace was the general methodology, the general thought process the engineer used. So we, 
we went to the data books and your group really got the standard 7400 series logic functions and then we put these elements into the computer in simulation so that an engineer who had designed a system with a certain particular set of logic components that he was familiar with would find the computer equivalent in, in FairSim. And I think that was a pretty key thing too because we then began to, if you will, uh, 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 train a body of engineers to use this methodology, but it wasn't too bad because they were already familiar with the basic elements that they were working with. It's just that they were now dealing with computer models instead of the real physical thing. And so uh, uh, we put that together and that sort of constituted, uh, there were lots of other things that, 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 that went on, uh, but that kind of constituted what we call the front end of our system. In the meantime, my colleague uh, from Stanford, who was a year behind Hugh and uh, me, joined Fairchild, Ed Jones, and he initially started working on test generation, Ed's an extremely bright fellow, and uh, uh, a methodology whereby we could figure out how to test these circuits when we built them. And that was very important because, uh, as everybody knows, not every circuit that comes out of a fab is good, so you have to have an efficient way of testing each and every circuit to know which ones to, to ship. Well, at the same time, Fairchild was developing a series of computer control testers so that they had computers in them and they could be fed with data which would then automate the testing of these integrated circuits. So I had another level of automation now that we could use and Ed did the original software work to feed these testers with the right patterns so that when the circuit was, was fabricated we could make sure that it, the actual circuit worked. The final thing that, uh, that Ed did, too, uh, uh, was uh, the other part of it, the key part, as I said earlier, is you now have to take this abstract computer model and translate it into the actual masks, the actual tooling that goes into the factory. And that's called a, a, a physical design system or a place and route system. And of course, we were in the infancy of that, and Ed and several of his colleagues also worked on creating that. And so by, I don't know, Rob, you can refresh my memory, somewhere by the early 70s, we had now a complete ASIC system. And the other thing that your group did, of course, is they developed the underlying circuit structures and the chip architectures. And as I remember, we had two product lines, Micromatrix and Micromosaic. So we now literally had at Fairchild a complete system which went all the way into a factory, really, and could allow engineers to specify circuits on a computer and end up with the actual circuits coming out of the factory being tested. And I suspect that was the first operation of that type. I think it was. I think yeah. it was a seminal work. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was interesting that our, our reputations were severely damaged by having done all this neat stuff. Right, <laughs> yes, that's certainly true. And we had, we had to rewrite our resumes and yeah, yeah. get rid of all of that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, there were two problems with that project. One is, is it really was hard. And the computing equipment that we had in that era was so expensive and so limited in capability, really. I remember we had this big, uh, um, 366, 370, 360, 67 IBM computer, it would probably just barely fit in this room. And it, it was a tiny fraction of today's PC in, 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 in capability. And it was very expensive, millions of dollars a month to operate. And so it, 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 was, it was a bit impractical. And then the other great development that, that, that I think diverted the, the world's attention from what we were doing for quite a while was, was, of course, the invention of the microprocessor because now a semiconductor company could build one part type and you know, apply it to all these various applications. And these specialized custom chips that we were getting very efficient at building, but they still, you, you know, you had to design a separate one for most of the applications. So, I think the combination of the fact that the computing hardware was not really where it needed to be and the, uh, the fact that uh, for a while at least the semiconductor industry thought you could do everything with microprocessors, which I believe it later turned out not to be true, but you know, it took them a while to get there, um, 
meant that that initial project uh, you know, was not a business success. I think we have to agree with that. It was a technical success in the sense that we were able to do this, but there was also some problems that, that I won't go into in actually fabricating the parts that, you know, we had, we had some difficulties there too. But fundamentally, I think we did demonstrate that every bit of that was practical. And it was kind of the economics and the, the stage in, in, in the development of technology that we did it that wasn't, it was, just wasn't quite, it, it, its time hadn't come yet. Uh, but I'm not ashamed of it one little bit. I, I think we, it was the seminal project of, of, of what is now called the ASIC. We started out with a, um, a thin, in those days in MOS there was a thick oxide process which had a very thick field oxide to prevent field inversion, but there were lots of processing problems associated with thick oxide uh, MOS. And there was another opportunity, or another process called a thin oxide, which had antimony field stops. And that process was running in prototype format in, the, uh, in one of the lines in the R&D fab, in fact, right across from the office that you and I shared, Rob. And uh, so we, I decided to put together some cells, some functions in that process, and we made, you remember the term kit parts? We made a bunch of kit parts, which were individual little functions. Uh, with the uh, antimony field, uh, field uh, uh, stop process. And that worked. And then we, we put together uh, a concept, which is shown here, for a standard cell gate array, really, standard cell uh, array, where each of the cells are different individual functions interconnected in, in the original technology, two layers, one diffusion and one metal. This is a paper that I gave, I think it's at the IEEE session in St. Louis in 1968, if I'm not mistaken. Jim Cofort gave a paper at that paper. same conference. And today in 1999, it's exactly the same thing, except that it's uh, 10,000 times more complex. Yes. But it's the same organization, same concept, same old, same old. 66 to 99. Right. Well, we, f we quickly outgrew the, uh, we got tired of the, the high impedance associated with the diffused interconnect. And uh, I can remember um, reading an article or a paper written by Ken Moyle, who was at National at the time, extolling the virtues of the, the then pr uh, improved uh, thick oxide metal gate process and detracting the silicon gate process, which had been invented at Fairchild and which National didn't have. So I decided it would be a good idea if we re reproduced this gate array family or this cell family in the silicon gate technology and got to go ahead to do that. And of course, the, uh, that was a much better family because we, uh, we really said we had like two and a half layers of interconnect. We could still use the diffusion a little bit, at least inside the cells. And then we used the polysilicon and the metal to complete a t an XY coordinate interconnect system. And that worked very well. And that's the family that we really took off on and, and uh, built up not only the circuit group, but also the CAD group that mm -hmm. you've described. Well, I remember we did the first credit card verifier for TRW. I remember that, yeah. And uh, I remember I went down and I told you, hey, it, it works you know, the first time. Yep. And you said, you mean it works the first time? And I said, well, that's the idea, isn't it? <laughs> you and mean we, it really works? And we went into production on that. Yep. You know. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Rob, at Fairchild, what products were you involved with? Well, there was uh, first something called medium scale integration, which is uh, uh, so-called MSI and consists of up to 100 gate complexity. And we defined those uh, things like 4-bit counters and uh, arithmetic logic units and things of that nature. And we did such a neat job of it that today, 1998, those functions are still available, same pinouts, same basic function as, as we came, came up with way back when. But my real love uh, was uh, large-scale integration, which again in, the, in, in those days was anything over 100 gates. And uh, so we started and did the 
seminal work in uh, gate arrays and uh, standard cell and computer-aided design. And that just as Fairchild was the mother of semiconductors, so was uh, Fairchild uh, uh, micro mosaic and micro matrix, the two uh, custom capabilities. They were the mothers of today's computer aided design uh, and uh, of the so called ASIC business. Rob, so continue your story with Will Corrigan. I understand you were founder of LSI, one of the founders of LSI Logic. Uh, yeah. Um, I hadn't done engineering for five years, but I really could. I knew what everybody was doing. And I told Will, we can blow away these people in just a couple of years. I, and these people being General Electric, IBM, um, Hughes Aircraft, uh, United Technologies, Motorola, in other words, Fortune 500 kind of companies, and our little startup, we could do better. So he offered me the job as VP of Engineering. And sure enough, we blew away those companies. Today, those that I mentioned, none of those people are in the uh, Gatorade business, or in fact, the ASIC business, or in most cases, not even the integrated circuit business, or semiconductors. Uh, and it just showed we were one of the very first to show that a small, uh, fast-moving startup company, what it could do. Why, why did you guys leave and, and find, uh, found Intel? What did you not like about Fairchild? Fairchild went through a peculiar period, and I don't know all of the history, but uh, they fired John Carter as CEO and put Dick Hodgson in. And six months later, almost six months to the day, uh, Hodgson was out as chief executive. Uh, you ought to get his story and what happened there. I've always been wanting to ask Tomorrow. him in heaven. Yeah. Uh, my impression was he also got fired, but I heard from someone else that he resigned, that he just didn't uh, want to uh, do the CEO job, which kind of surprised me. Anyhow, uh, they had fired two CEOs, or two CEOs were gone within a six-month period, and they were trying to run the company with a three-man committee of the board of directors, while looking on the outside for another uh, CEO. Uh, the likely internal candidate was Bob Noyce, uh, you know, certainly well qualified by any measure. He'd run the most successful part of the company. It was a world-leading operation, but they were going to bypass him. That kind of ticked Bob off, and he decided that he didn't like that very much. And knowing Bob wasn't happy and was going to leave, and that we were going to have somebody else coming in from the outside who would probably want to make major changes in the operation I had, I said, eh, I think I'd rather leave before than after. So the two of us decided to leave and then went out and uh, uh, got financing to set up a company to look at new technology and new product areas and semiconductor memory. Uh, Fairchild Cameron Instrument was a company that was located in Syosset, New York, which is in Long Island. And it had, a, a, other than when uh, Sherman died, uh, uh, the attitude uh, changed a bit. Uh, they had a very, what I call an Eastern mentality, in that uh, they uh, didn't want anybody to have any options or in stock. And uh, the uh, eight entrepreneurs who uh, started Fairchild Semiconductor uh, uh, decided that individually and together that they would gradually peel off and, uh, and form their own uh, enterprises because they couldn't get any more equity. In, and uh, a lot of the people there felt that uh, they should be giving equity to uh, some of the people who had, hadn't helped start the company but who were uh, instrumental in its, in its success and 
Fairchild Cameron instrument were uh, was unwilling to do that. So gradually they peeled off, and finally, by 1968, there were only uh, Noyce and Moore that left. And then, uh, then they decided to leave. Then they decided to leave. And you were instrumental in that as well. Correct. So what did you do? <laughs> what did I do? Well, I got a call from Noyce one day in 1968 saying, uh, well, I've been talking to him off and on anyway. And finally, in talking to him about the possibilities of doing something, and um, finally in 1968, he called me and said, gee, I think maybe uh, Gordon and I do want to uh, leave Fairchild Semiconductor and, uh, and uh, go into business for ourselves. And uh, so we talked about it for a while, and uh, I asked him how much money they needed, and he said two and a half million dollars. And uh, so, well, how much money are you guys willing to put up? And they thought about it for a while and said, well, we'll each put up a quarter of a million dollars, which represented a fairly good portion of their net worth at the time. And so um, I uh, was able to raise the $2.5 million pretty quickly for them. Now, did they have a business plan, a written plan? I wrote the business plan, <laughs> and it was a page and a half, <clears throat> and uh, I had raised all the money before I even sent the plan out. Maybe people knew knew me and knew uh, uh, Noyce and Moore, and uh, they were anxious to uh, to invest. Well, what was Bob Noyce like? That's a very difficult question because it depends on from what where you're looking at him. He's a very he's probably the most complex man I have ever met uh, in his interests. Um, he's an inventor. He's a uh, a, a an athlete. Um, he likes likes uh, learning all kinds of new things. Um, doesn't like to fire people, or he didn't. Uh, he liked to help people make their own decisions. Um, he, he was interested. He he uh, was interested in music. He uh, had a magical group. Um, it's just uh, of extreme, and as I said, extremely complex in in his tastes. And of course, Gordon Moore. Well, Gordon was completely straightforward. Uh, there's not much uh, that you don't see that isn't there. I mean, there isn't much there that you don't see. Um, he knows where he wants to go. And, uh, and 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 leads people there. I, he often makes a statement that he's an accidental entrepreneur. And I don't think that's quite right. Uh, Gordon never stood out in the beginning uh, when we were putting Fairchild Semiconductor together. And I don't actually remember his being very active he was more a passive type. But as time went on, Gordon kept on growing and growing and um, just grew into various positions until he became now the senior statesman of the uh, semiconductor industry. And uh, I don't think any of this was accidental. I think it, was, uh, it would have happened regardless of, uh, of intel. Had uh, had Gordon Moore and uh, Bob Noyce started Intel yet? Would no, you? no, they started. Uh, they started, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, after I had proven that uh, that it was working. We had uh, we had uh, 30, the uh, the uh, uh, thirty seven oh eight was was uh, you know came out already, and basically they knew that uh, the technology was working. In fact, I suspected that they were going to use Silicon Gate technology in, at Intel, and I told. Uh, 
I told uh, Bob Seeds, I remember in those days, I say, hey, I'm, I'm my, I have a hunch they're going to use Silicon Valley technology. And uh, Bob Seeds said, well, if they do that, uh, we're going to sue them. Which uh, they didn't do. Yeah, which they didn't do. But I, I remember that I was, uh, you know, I was a, a boy from Italy and didn't, didn't understand the ways of the, of, of the state. So suing was something very, very strange for me in those days. Uh, uh, the, the origin of Intel, I mean, it's very clear that uh, the, this, you know, the, the Silicon Valley technology, where it came from, and, and uh, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, later on, but that's patented the idea of polysilicon uh, to silicon contact, which was my idea at first, and I found out in 74 that he actually had patented that idea as Intel. <laughs> But then, uh, so you decided, rather than fight them, to join them. So in 1970, uh, you went to uh, Yeah, Intel. in 1970, I decided that, uh, that I had enough of Virtual with, uh, with Noyce and Moore leaving, uh, the new management team coming in. Uh, Virtual was beginning to really uh, uh, have a slow but steady decline. And also, my interest w was more uh, toward uh, to a design, and I was, be, be, you know, getting less and less interested in uh, process technology. Although I managed to develop in '69 and channel uh, polysilicon devices, I also developed uh, uh, bipolar NMOS in a single, you know, what now is called BiCMOS. We had I had early <laughs> BiCMOS uh, uh, devices built uh, in in those days, just just the beginning of it. Uh, and I also managed to make thin film transistors using polysilicon material. And so I, uh, it was a very particularly creative period of my time. And, and, and I enjoyed uh, virtual labs, but it was time for me to move on. And so I went to my old boss, which uh, was Vadez. He was my boss at, at uh, uh, virtual as well. And, uh, and he had joined uh, Intel in, uh, basically soon after the uh, uh, Intel was founded. And I, I call him up and I ask uh, if he had a job for me because I wanted to design the Silicon Gate. Uh, Fertile was uh, was very you know Fertile did, still did not have a, a good Silicon Gate process technology in production that I could use, and so I decided to leave. Boys and more were 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 getting ready to fo to found Intel. He told me, and he and Bob uh, told me he was going to do that. He was still there. Uh, and hadn't left, and the public didn't know that uh, he was going to that thing. Uh, but uh, they sent out the chairman of the board of directors, who was a lawyer, to get me. And I just told him to shove it up something, you know. And I had no interest in it. I really didn't. And uh, I knew I'd pass them, I'd pass TI. I thought, what the hell do I need? I don't need your problems, you know. And uh, so I wanted to uh, stay there. I wouldn't have gone if uh, Bob Noyce, I, I, I had great respect for Bob Noyce. And uh, he's a great salesman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a wanderlust sort of fellow anyway. I get bored after a while doing the same thing. And each time, to me, it was a success. It was a success. I was a success at Bell Laboratories. I was a success at Harvard. My nine graduate students were the brightest ones at Harvard. And they really were. You can go talk to them and see who they are. I'll give you their names if you want. And uh, the, in fact, some of the professors were raising hell with me because you're taking all the good students and we're left with the juniors to him. I said, you know, they, they just like me. <laughs> so what was the, it was a challenge, was it? Yeah, a fair it, it's a challenge. Why did I go to the Navy when I didn't have to? Yeah. I could have gotten a, got a job, and if you had a degree in engineering, the, uh, they weren't going to take you away from uh, some company that said they had, uh, had to have less Hogan. And I could have done that, but I didn't. I wanted to go to the Navy. I just, I just wanted to do different things. So and you went to Fairchild. So what did you find when you got there? It was a disaster when I got there. It really was. Uh, they, and most of the blame goes to the people at Syosset. My God, they were building all kinds of things. They were building... Uh, 
and these big machines to print newspapers, you know. So I spent about a month, or maybe a month and a half, finding out what the hell I was running, you know, other than semiconductor. And I just got a team together and said, go get rid of these guys. Just throw everything, sell it to anybody at any price. Get out of these, all these business. We have really one business, that's semiconductors. And we did, and we sold them, you know, uh, at reasonable prices, you know. We didn't lose money on any of them. We didn't make any money on them either, but uh, it sort of broke even. I was the president of the company until 1974, and in 1974 the sales, which were almost entirely semiconductor uh, by that time, were $384 million in sales at Fairchild with a profit of $27 million. Now you brought quite a few people in from yes, Motorola. Yeah. Well, yes, I didn't really go in. I, I honestly didn't ask them. I figured that if the good ones came to me, they'd have a job, but I wasn't going to, uh, you know, they had to come to me. I didn't, I then I, in all honesty, not to say that to protect myself from Bob Galvin, who wanted to put me in jail, uh, it's neither here nor there. Uh, the thing is, uh, I just, uh, they did, they came, they came of their own, they called me up. They called me up from uh, Taiwan, you know, places like that. Hey, Les, is this true? And I said, yeah, it's true. And he said, I'm going to stop off and see you there, and uh, as soon as I get here, I'm, gonna say, I'm coming up to see you at Fairchild. And they walked in, you got a job for me? <laughs> and I said, you're a damn good guy. <laughs> and I said, I don't know yet, because I, you know, I'm not familiar with what's going on here. But I'll take you on, you know. We'll make money on it anyway, you know. I'm, I'm not worried about that. We'll, we'll, we'll have profit and we can pay you and we'll, we'll figure out what the job is going to be later on, but you've got a job. They went home, went back, they told Fairchild on Motorola, we're leaving, we're going with less, and you know, there were about three every day for a while. So Motorola sued? Yeah, they sued me, yeah. That's all right. We won. <laughs> But now, uh, and of course I was there at that time, yeah. uh, there was a, uh, seemed to me a great cultural uh, uh, difference between the people from Phoenix and the people from in what the Bay way? Area. In what way? That, we... that, well, I mean, we had people like Jerry Sanders, very flamboyant. Yes, and, uh, yeah. And the, and, the, and the Motorola people were quite conservative. Yeah. You know, uh, I had to fire uh, him. I won't tell you why, and I'll take it to my grave. Well, uh, there was a, uh, at Fairchild, there was a, uh, a culture that everybody went to the wagon wheel yeah. after work, N not only Fairchild people, but competitors, and they all talked and, uh, and compared notes, uh, and the Motorola people uh, were very, were shocked yeah, they were very shocked that uh, you would do that. Uh, we were very, even with the size of uh, the Motorola activity, we were ourselves. We, we, we wouldn't tell anybody on the outside even what we were thinking about. You know, it was just, uh, there was a difference there. And I don't know why. I, uh, I'll say this in all honesty, although it, uh, the people that worked for me wherever I was, whenever I was, when I got to know them and they got to know me, they liked me. They really did. And uh, the ones that came from uh, Motorola were evidence of that situation. They came to me. They wanted to be wherever I was. And uh, I wouldn't take them if they weren't bright. <laughs> yeah, you know, you have some guys uh, every once in a while that aren't too bright, uh, you find that out a year or two later. <laughs> I used to, uh, 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 
problem, a uh, thing I used to do about every year, I demanded a 5%, uh, you had to get rid of 5% of your people. And you know why? Because they didn't have the courage to fire the deadheads. And uh, every year there are about 5% that are deadheads. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have the courage, they were too nice. And now Fairchild was still basically run from New York. And um, they had a series of um, managements. And the guy from Corning, uh, John Carter, um, probably did the most damage. Um, and he had an idea of um, leveraging the success of the semiconductor business to go acquire other little companies. And um, I remember when F Hogan and the group got there and we talked to the Fairchild people um, and went into the, the finances, what was happening just when the semiconductor industry was exploding, they were asking the semiconductor division to operate to maximize cash flow when to support these other losing divisions on the East Coast making equipment. And so that was why Fairchild was underinvested. I mean, with Hogan and, and I and the other people arrived, we were puzzled that there was no capital investment, that all of the assembly and test equipment, all of the diffusion equipment was ancient. Uh, it was very backward. They hadn't done any of the things that uh, we'd been doing at Motorola. And so our initial conclusion was we just have to put a massive infusion of capital into the company to revive it. Um, and of course, as Hogan arrived, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore left. And of course, uh, and Andy Grove. And of course, they took the, um, the Silicon Gate process with them at the time. I mean, clearly. I mean, if, if, if somehow magically I, I could come back in time and see what I would have done, I would have, I would have sued them and, and taken all the strategies that Intel later employed to get their position in the marketplace. I would have soon, soon have sued them because, and prevented that company from taking off with the basic technology that was right. developed at Fairchild. People started to leave. And it was about that time, of course, that uh, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore left to found Intel. That was in 1950, uh, sorry, 1968. Uh, at the time, I was still the uh, uh, worldwide marketing director. I'd been, by that time, I'd been elevated to the worldwide marketing director. Still, I was very young and thought the world could, uh, we could still change the world. Uh, Dick Hodson, who was the president at the time, you know, uh, was a guy I had great admiration for. Uh, I was given a bunch of stock options and told that, you know, the world was going to be great. And uh, then, when the world wasn't so great and Fairchild had to cut back, they decided they needed some new management and we were shocked. They brought in, uh, Bob Noyce left, as I said, uh, Charlie Spork, who had been general manager of the business, left to form National. Uh, Charlie hired me, or he thinks he hired me. He made me an offer to be his uh, vice president of marketing worldwide. And uh, I said I couldn't do that without telling the people at Fairchild first. And uh, they persuaded me that I would someday be the president of Fairchild, that I had, there was no limit to where I could go. They laid some more stock options on me, and I made the mistake of staying. Turns out it was the right thing to do as life worked out, but I didn't know it at the time. Anyway, Charlie Spork uh, uh, basically uh, said I'd made a terrible mistake. And uh, he found out that the reason I decided to stay was that uh, I had misspoken up until now. I wasn't yet the worldwide marketing director. I was a sales manager, and I said I wanted to be the worldwide director. If I wouldn't have, if I would have joined Charlie, I would have been. But um, I said I wasn't going to stay on and not be. Well, there was a problem because there was already a worldwide marketing director at Fairchild named Don Valentine, who was a good friend. But um, uh, I said, you know, Don's there, and I'm behind Don, and I don't want to wait. And uh, Tom Bay said, Well, how much time will you give me? <laughs> and in my brash youth, I said, Till Friday. And I think this was on a Monday. And on Friday, Don was terminated, and I was made worldwide marketing uh, director. I was shocked. So there I was at you know, 
uh, 30 years old, 31 years old, and wow, just had the world was my oyster. But as it turns out, uh, Fairchild had to change managements. Uh, they, you know, Charlie Spork left, Tom Bay was promoted, it didn't work out. Uh, they brought in a whole team of guys. Lester Hogan, uh, Hogan's Heroes. Very interesting time. Uh, C. Lester Hogan's a brilliant guy, and he'd made Motorola quite a success by automating the production of transistors. But of course, transistors were old news. But that's what made Motorola success, so he came in and instead of, I think, taking the uh, advantage of the wonderful innovations and technology that was in place at Fairchild, instead he seemed to want to make Im them over in Motorola's image. Uh, and as I said, I was a brash young man, and uh, I couldn't help but tell him why I thought a lot of things he was doing was wrong. But my, uh, I guess I should take the time to tell one story that cost me my job. Uh, we went to visit Digital Equipment Corporation. In those days, it was called DEC. Now it's just called Digital. Now it's gone. It's part of Compaq, which is now gone, part of HP. But uh, the founder of Digital uh, had a meeting set up with Les Hogan. And uh, uh, we went to meet with him. And when we got there, uh, I had properly briefed Les Hogan on what we should say about our proprietary family of digital building blocks, which were TTL building blocks called MSI, medium scale integration, uh, the 9300. Uh, Ken Olson, who was the founder of Digital Equipment, was quite a good engineer, and I thought that he would be very responsive and receptive to our pitch on why these were a superior way to assemble a computer and why they were built with a system in mind as opposed to just being random collections of gates. Well, uh, we talked and Les said to Ken, so what do you want us to do? So Ken said, well, you know, I got a problem. Texas Instruments has their Series 54 and there's a lot of sources of that and you're a sole source on the Series 9300. Sure would make my life easier if you just agree to build Series 5474. And to my amazement, Les Hogan said, if that's what you want, that's what we're going to do. Well, what did that mean? It meant that all of our proprietary development, all of our invention, all of our innovation, all of our competitive advantage was down the tubes. And all we had now was the opportunity to be an alternate source to TI, who was already a giant manufacturer. So afterwards, the, after the meeting, um, we were walking, we were outside, and I was just really so upset. I'd worked so hard, my people had worked so hard, all the engineering people had worked so hard to win that design, and all we had to do was say, Series 74 is not competitive with our solution. I'm sorry, but this is the way to go, and I know he would have gone. I mean, you could tell, he was just shocked that we agreed. So Les Hogan said, what do you think? And I said, I think you just wrecked the company. Wrong thing to say to the uh, president of a public company, especially when uh, he has uh, just recently taken over. So uh, I think that's what sort of signed my death warrant with Fairchild. But uh, just to close that story out and move on to AMD, which is uh, the pride of my life, short of my daughters, of course. Um, one day, uh, I decided that, <laughs> which is amazing in retrospect, that I was the best candidate to run the semiconductor operation. As I'd mentioned earlier, Fairchild Cameron Instrument, of, of which Les Hogan was the president, was the parent company, but he was also acting as vice president and general manager of Fairchild Semiconductor, which was really the heart and soul of the business. But at some point in time, it was pretty clear he was going to name somebody to be president of Fairchild Semiconductor. At least I thought he was. So I said I'd throw my hat in the ring. <laughs> so I remember Les saying to me, well, Jerry, of course you'll be considered. You know, you're one of the smartest guys I know. Uh, and he said, but let me ask you this. What if you aren't named? What if you aren't the guy selected to be the president? Now, I know now that the only thing to say was, Les, whatever you want, I know is whatever you want to do, I'm sure that's the right decision, and I'll support it 100%. But you know, when you're 31, 32 years old, you say, I said, you know, Les, I can't guarantee my behavior. Oh, wow. So not guaranteeing my behavior was perceived by Lester as a threat. 
So he hired a guy from TI to replace me, and bingo, I was out. One thing I will share with you now that I've never shared with anyone else, uh, just before I came over to uh, left Motorola, I had an operation at Mayo Clinic, and they damn near killed me. Uh, and uh, it took uh, several years and some very brilliant uh, doctors here in this section who were able to find what the hell Mayo Clinic did to me and fix it up for me. So I was running on, on one leg for a period of time, and in uh, 1974, I was in uh, such a bad physical situation that we talked it out uh, with the uh, uh, people at uh, uh, the board of directors, and uh, I told them, you know, I, 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 I want to stay here. I want to have a, a proprietary position, but uh, I, to be honest with you, I can't run the company anymore. I, I don't have the physical capability. It turns out I can do it now because uh, the surgeons here were able to fix me up, but I wasn't fixed up until about 19... 85. So you became the vice chairman of the board? Yeah. And, and uh, Wilf then, Corrigan Well, once he got in, the that's why president. she's mad, you see. Once he got in, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let me do anything, you see. That uh, it, it wasn't the way it was planned. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you, would, you would probably, uh, like Gordon Moore is today, uh, I imagine you would want to be, you would have wanted to be in kind of that position, the senior that's, statesman, the strategist. That's exactly what I wanted. And then have uh, an Andy Grove run of the exactly, day to day kind of thing. That's what I asked for, but my Andy Grove tried to get rid of me. And then over time at, at Fairchild, the, um, you know, we went through the uh, 74 recession and we never lost money in the 74 uh, recession. Um, and through 79, we finally had to back up to doing 700 million or so a year and making 15% you know, pre-tax profits. And then um, there was a hostile takeover from Gould, which um, you know, I think we detailed in your book. And, they, um, and I think at the time that hostile takeover started, the price was $16 a share. And by the time we sold the company to Schlumberger, it was $66 a share. So the, um, certainly the shareholders made out OK, and the, uh, most of the, the management people did OK on the stock options and, and so on. But then after that, I mean, the Fairchild story was more or less over. But it's interesting to see that the remnants of the Fairchild it was has recently now spun up as a, as a new company. And again, still doing $500 million a year. Uh, you know, my, I, I would have to say my most exciting day in Silicon Valley was the day I showed up. And my, most, my saddest day was the day Fairchild was no more. Well, what, what went wrong? I mean, what? Well, it really, you know, it really depends on when you think about it. If, I, if, I be, if I'm a little cynical, what I would say is that what went wrong is in 1967, Sherman Fairchild made John Carter president of Fairchild instead of Bob Noyce. Uh, because if he'd made Bob Noyce president of Fairchild, Fairchild would be Intel. And because Bob had a very clear vision of what he wanted to do, and he, he was bound and determined to do it. And that would have been the best possible thing that could have happened. Uh, to the company, but, but if you if you say okay, that was a foregone conclusion, uh, all all of that's you know water under the name. What happened later? What happened in the 70s that led to this thing? 
Um, I would say there were a couple of uh, two or three uh, decisions that, in retrospect, were probably big mistakes. One was getting into the consumer electronics business and making games and watches. And of course, that was one that we all made. I'm so not blaming was, anyone. I mean, we all we all made the mistake and we all got killed. Right. Uh, but 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 Fairchild was just enough precar just precarious enough financially, where it. Uh, it uh, it really it really hurt the company seriously, and as a consequence, we wound up underinvesting in MOS technology at a, at, a, at a time when MOS was taking over the world. We were still riding on the strength of our bipolar technology, which was probably the best in the world. Isoplanar bipolar was 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 second to none, and so we got caught in this famous trap of of living off what we had done well, but not really obsoleting ourselves with newer technology and 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 so I finally got the task of trying to rebuild you know play catch up on MOS as you remember I became group, group vice president of the MOS group but frankly it was pretty late in the day at that point and yeah, there were a lot of <coughs> a lot of bodies already <coughs> I was actually in that group and we would have a vice president that would every 18 months that's, that's come right. stumbling in I lasted a little longer than that <laughs> and, and yes, they would always say, we're going to run MOS like a business. And uh, a lot of arm waving and all this stuff, and then disaster. It turns out 18 months isn't enough time to turn it around. And so they'd be out, and some new guy would come in, and uh, oh, it was just terrible. As a, as a worker bee there, it was just awful. These, uh, these guys, had, and they, they ju just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I left before you came, so I can't include you in that. Well, we finally made a little money in the division, but it wasn't a whole lot. Uh, the, the problem was we just didn't have the capital equipment budget to really to, to really get up caught up with the leading edge. So we, you know, we were kind of bunting and stealing second base and doing all the crazy things you do to try to get by. But it wasn't a way to really build a a, a, a strong enterprise. And uh, and the other thing I think we I think we made one other mistake. Uh, too, and that was we went we went into the dynamic RAM business at a time when it was already well populated with a lot of other people, and and we probably wound up losing fifty million dollars, which in 1970 was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Of course, and again, that everybody did that. Everyone did that, and and so it was understandable why we did it. But but it, but timing is everything, right? So so what you had was you had this disaster with the consumer electronics, and right on the heels of that was this disaster with dynamic RAMs. And suddenly we were just flat out of money, and we were now a takeover target, and we and we got put into play uh, by a you know a hostile takeover, and uh, we wound up finding a white knight, which was Schlumberger, and that was the end of that story. Yeah. Well, the Schlumberger days. Were you there during the Schlumberger takeover? I was there during the early early part, early days. I was. They, they had given us golden handcuffs, which which meant I really wouldn't get. The benefit of the of the buyout, unless I stayed for a couple of years, uh, so I just gritted my teeth and, and decided to stay and try to make a go of it. Uh, it was it was it was difficult. Well, what was the deal with Tom Roberts? I mean, what he didn't know anything about semiconductors. Yeah, and 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 I'm not sure he really cared to know anything about semiconductors. And uh, 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 you know, he he was caught up in the metaphor that uh, uh, that that the chip was the oil of the electronic era, and you know, Schlumberger knew how to mine the oil industry, so maybe they could use some of the same things they did there to 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 take advantage in the semiconductor industry. It sounded it sounded great when when eloquently presented, but but the reality is that when you're running a business on a day-to-day -day basis. You've got to make a thousand microscopic decisions, all of which mean you have to have a very detailed knowledge of the business, none of which uh, uh, management had. And management wasn't, frankly, interested in learning nor taking advice from those of us who, who kind of knew the business. And uh, it just got worse. And, and I mean, everyone who was an observer, I know you were, just saw it get worse and worse and worse. And finally, I just threw up my hands and left. Yeah. Well, there were also uh, age discrimination issues. Were there not? Weren't there people that were laid off because they were older? I think that was true, yeah. 
I think you can go around and see a lot of the guys who at that at that point in their life were were 50, 50 you know 50ish plus or minus uh, and they found they didn't have a job I mean whether it's Andy Procasini or you know any of the other guys you and I both knew well they were all in that category yeah so let me just tell you one little anecdote on that as to sort of the the way uh, the, the the strange way life uh, life works is uh, one of my patents was for the basic process about how you make a CCD. And it turned out that that process was the way the whole world adopted making them. So henceforth, and even to this day, people still make CCDs the way I articulated my patent. So needless to say, my patent was worth a lot. Uh, when Fairchild sort of fell apart, uh, it wound up uh, going with uh, ultimately with uh, Laurel, you know, the one with the East Coast part of it, as opposed to the National, National Semiconductor part. part, and uh, and uh, Laurel realized when they purchased that that this patent may be worth worth a lot. Now Fairchild, and because of all the turmoil, hadn't really pushed uh, getting the license fees on this, but Laurel being a little little bit more uh, diligent about trying to get value out of what they had bought, discovered they had a patent that was probably worth billions of dollars. And so what they proceeded to do was go to Japan and, and so tell every Japanese company, all of whom are now making CCDs, Sony and so forth, and basically saying, <clears throat> by the way, you owe us uh, uh, some money on royalties you haven't been paying. And uh, I think the average, average uh, catch-up fee on that was somewhere between two and three hundred million dollars per company. Mm. And uh, so I got, I, needless to say, this was litigated and so forth, and I was involved in it. But anyhow, the patent wind up being worth um, several billion dollars. If I, if I owned that patent, I'd be as rich as Ross Perot, and, and, and then I wouldn't even run for office. I mean, it was <laughs> one of those, so that's the story there. We started uh, going to hell in a handbasket, you know. And uh, we had to sell or we were going to go bankrupt. And uh, Schlumberger made the best offer. And uh, they fired Wolf on the first day they got there. They hated him. <laughs> and not because I told them. Yeah. And then they installed Tom Roberts. Yeah, which was a mistake. Which is. I loved the guy. He was a nice guy, but not, I don't know, what the hell did he know about well, our business, you know? He didn't know anything about it. Now, his boss was a very bright guy. And the trouble is, a guy, and I'm trying to remember his name, who was president of... Uh, uh, Roubaix? Roubaix, yeah. He died, you know, right around that period. Uh, right soon after they bought it, he died, and they ended up finally with some first-class jerk, you know, the uh, only thing he knew about was oil wells, and he thought anything else was a waste of time. So the whole thing fell apart, but by that time I had actually taken, uh, I was gone, you know, I got my pension and left. <laughs> Schlumberger, to me, killed Fairchild. Right. It killed it. Fairchild, up to the time Schlumberger came along, uh, back in 79, could credit, Wilf was right, it could credit about $600 million worth of business a year, which at that time was, was near the top. It wasn't the top by any means, but it was pretty high up there. It was only, only second to Motorola and TI, and then, of course, some of the Japanese companies. But $600 million worth of business at that growth rate today would be multi-billion dollars. But then came Schlumberger and everything changed. The main thing that changed was this old oil, European-oriented conservative atmosphere came in. I was called in personally by Tom Roberts and told that the first thing you're going to have to do if you want to continue working at Fairchild and you're reporting to me as president is you're going to have to give up all this technology transfer work. And I said, well, gee, Tom, uh, you know, I can take orders like anybody else, but why? It's doing so well. We're getting bottom line results. He said, at Schlumberger, 
we do not transfer technology. The technology belongs to the company and it goes nowhere except staying in the company. And that's how we've gotten so big. And he says there's another thing. We live on loyalty. A person stays with the company because he's, he's loyal to it. And he gives his loyalty to the company. And if he starts to change jobs, he's not a person you can trust because he's disloyal. And he looked at me and he said, you guys in the semiconductor industry are a bunch of immature kids. You have never really grown up. You will go across the street because somebody gives you a promise in the form of an option or pays you more money. And you forget about loyalty to the company. He said, that's the only way you can build a future by your, for yourself is to be loyal. I said, but Tom, we're not living in that kind of a world. If we were living among the oil experts in France like Schlumberger and everybody was observing that kind of a thing, this, this is not our world. We're entrepreneurs here and every worker thinks he can be an entrepreneur even when he isn't. You have to keep him based on his work is fun and he gets adequate participation and one of those things is to get options, stock sharing, or something where you're part of the action. And across the street the guy's going to offer it to him when you can you're going to lose him. And he lost guys immediately from Fairchild, including myself, that, uh, that you know left even on their own, weren't even asked to leave like so many others were. It was a totally different kind of a character. He reminded me a lot of Shockley, not as brilliant very egotistical. You could hardly talk to the guy. I remember uh, Sheila and I went to a, a dinner at his house. He was fond of currying favor by uh, inviting people to his house. He had a beautiful house up in the hills in, in, um, uh, above Saratoga, Los Gatos. And as I uh, came in, I noticed he had on his uh, mantelpiece a beautiful Russian samovar. Now I have one. Uh, we have one in our dining room because I inherited it from my mother who inherited it from her grandmother. And we've never had much personal possessions, but she carried that some of our everywhere she went, this hot water cooker. And Tom had one, and I walked over it. And I said, Tom, what a surprise to see a genuine Minsk, Minsk some of our here. I could tell by the trademarks on it, by the engravings on it. And I, I meant it as a compliment. Well, he turned around and he said, what's the matter? You don't think I'm uh, wise enough or smart enough to know the value of a some of our? No, I said, hey, Tom, hey. Easy. <laughs> I think it's a nice one. How'd you get it? And I just wanted to walk away from that subject. But he was that type of a person. When he was at the dinner table, he dominated the conversation. And he called on people like a professor calls on his class. And now, Cello, do you have something to say? And, you know, and of course, I'm a shrinking violet anyway. So if you're asking me, do I have something to say, that's an offense. <laughs> <laughs> of course I have something to say. <laughs> Sheila tells me I always have something to say, but that's not the point. And he was that kind of an ego, and he never really understood from the beginning what the culture was in the world that he was entering. And he thoroughly squelched uh, all of that initiative. And the first thing that happened was, within a month, a half a dozen of the best guys who saw, you know, who could predict everything uh, happening in business, they all left. Well, Wilf himself, for example, thought that an, uh, uh, an ideal way for Fairchild to continue under Schlumberger was Wilf would still remain in charge. It would be like uh, another start. And Schlumberger would be the, the, the daddy with the deep pockets, serving on the board and all that sort of stuff. And Wilf thought for sure that he was going to be uh, CEO. I'm sure he's glad that it didn't happen because he went on to do other bigger things. But that wasn't Schlumberger's way at all. And then the Schlumberger people, uh, they went on a youth Far kick. Far worse, yeah. Uh, they, uh, you know, get rid of everybody over a certain age. And That's right. Bring in uh, all uh, the young, kids all the young people. Yeah, who you can, who you can mold to your own, uh, to your own standards. And of course, you know what that does. The one thing we lack in the semiconductor industry is good experience. <laughs> And that's the first thing they wanted to get rid of. You know, Schlumberger, if they would have treated Fairchild like a startup, you guys, you got a business going here, you're not making a profit, you should make more profit, put it that way, and we'll let you run it, 
but you got to toe the mark, and uh, here's what we'll finance and all that sort of stuff. Now you make it grow, and we'll give you growing money. I think it would have taken off. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Roberts had this presentation where by the year, I don't know what it was, maybe it was 1995 or the year 2000, there would be only two semiconductor companies yeah. left. Yes. Fairchild, and I believe the other was uh, TI. TI, right, yeah. And, uh, well, for, you know why TI? You know, because forget Intel. Texan. Roberts is a Texan, oh. and he's an ex-Marine from Texas. Yeah, but you know, forget Intel, those, yeah. forget Motorola. Oh, yeah, those are they're, the Johnny-come-latelys. They're going, because we have deeper pockets. Uh, it, it, it reminded me of the Vietnam War. You know, we can win because we... We're, we have we're, more suds. Yeah. yeah. Last longer. And uh, we drop more bombs. Well, you know, that it doesn't, doesn't work. work. No, yeah. it doesn't work that way. There was a third contract that you won't believe now. I happened to have the dubious honor of being one of the, one of the first guys into uh, China on behalf of Fairchild during this period. And that was in uh, about 1970. It was during the time we was tussling with the Tungsrum contract about, and we were carrying on, you know, discussion activities at various levels. That took a few years to develop, but actually, uh, by the time uh, Schlumberger had uh, come into place, I actually had uh, the step, the letters of intent. I had the intent signatures for a, uh, an operation in what was then the Silicon Valley of China in the province of Changsha in Hunan province. We were all ready to go. We had the contract, and it was going to be another one of these tongues room type operations. Fantastic. Really had that. Well, and that I was today so proud that, of that, Rob. Today that would have been worth Oh, and you know, we, and we got the license. You know, I thought uh, Shepard was a bully. I, uh, I thought he, uh, he, he tried to manage the thing from the top. Uh, he, he never let he never let the, the management of the organization have enough time, much less enough uh, resources and latitude to run the business the way they thought to, thought they should. And uh, it became uh, one that just wasn't fun, you know. It just, uh, uh, you know, with TI, it wasn't ever very profitable either. So it's not profitable, it's not fun, it's Dallas, Texas. I mean, what else do you need? <laughs> Well, uh, who who recruited you to Fairchild? Uh, Mickey McCray, I guess. No, is it Mickey McCray? Yeah, Mickey McCray, uh, who's a headhunter. He uh, he got me with Tom Roberts. I had uh, I went there in '83, and I guess it had been like '80. They'd come after me before, and. Uh, so Roberts, uh, I got to know pretty good during the eighty time period, and I f and uh, he he I forget who called who in eighty eighty three, but anyway I was kind of fed up and looking for something else to do and uh, and uh, so we got together then and uh, from there it was introduced to Michelle Bayo, who was running the electronics part of Slumberger then, and. Uh, it was understood from the first that I would come there and then as executive vice president that I'd move on to be president. Uh, I had to place my foot firmly in Tom, Tom Roberts' back to get him out of there ultimately, but it took two years, but it did. He did. Well, he, uh, he made a lot of changes. He and Slumberger made a lot of changes mm -hmm. uh, that ultimately resulted in the demise of the, of the company. Mm -hmm. um, what what did, what did you see when you get there, when you got there? <laughs> well, first, uh, if you think of Schlumberger as being uh, the way it grew up, and um, it, it became a successful company by farming small business units, which is usually a blue truck, a deck computer, and, a, and some kind of downhole measuring equipment. They try, and, and, and a, a Texas Aggie with a, with a, uh, technician uh, running around the, the southwest uh, measuring things down hole. Then this guy was responsible for getting it done, getting the results back, getting the billings done, and everything else. I mean, it was the most perfect decentralized unit you can imagine. And they tried to apply that to the semiconductor industry. So first thing I found was that 
you know, 32 different manufacturing areas on a $500,000 a year business. Uh, it was just incredible. Everybody had their own fab, everybody had packaging and tests, everybody had this, had that, and it was just grossly uneconomical. And uh, in contrast, the industry's gone to foundries, big fabs, you know, uh, separate the business units from the manufacturing units, this kind of thing. And uh, I spent all the time I was there trying to build big fabs in, in uh, productivity, high productivity areas like Japan, Nagasaki, Japan, and fab and built them with to uh, Sony and shut down this inefficient stuff so that uh, a wafer could be manufactured at a reasonable cost. Uh, the other thing I found was that uh, I guess it hit me one night as I was contemplating what I was going to do that probably more than half the people over there would wanted me to fail because they just liked me to get out of their hair and go on do the non-productive little things that they've been doing for the last five or ten years and they weren't really interested in seeing the company profitable, upgraded, and so forth and so on. They just wanted their eight to five and get out of there. So I was convinced that I had to, I had to move people out of the company, out of some jobs, and I had to do it very quickly to ever uh, get the right kind of people, the right attitudes, the right centralization of large capital intensive business, and, the, and to be able to find a way to attract the right design and application talent. Well, as it was, from the time I took over president in, in 85 to 87, we sold it, and actually it just, it just took too much, it took too much and too little time to ever get it done. The uh, kind of interesting to see Fairchild come back public now. And oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we sold it for 200000 It comes back for a billion, too, or something. Well, Tom Robert struck me as being awfully arrogant. Is that oh, uh, the case? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't think there's any question, and probably Tom would admit, to, to the success they had at Schlumberger. And you have to remember, he's, he started he was a uh, West Point graduate, started out in uh, sales at Schlumberger and at, um, at IBM, I'm sorry, moved into Schlumberger in the financial area and he, he came, became CFO. So uh, two things that are a little hard to understand is why there would be this arrogance in a, if you come from an industry that's totally different than the one you're in. You'd, you'd seem like you'd be a little bit taken back that uh, it'd take a while to learn it. But I didn't seem to bother him. Um, and the second thing is that, uh, you know, it's from a financial background, and, and I guess the belief was if you could manage one industry or one segment of one industry, you could manage anything, but it sure, surely didn't, it didn't map over. I think probably the demise of Fairchild is probably pretty well understood. Um, it, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have a lot of ideas because so much of the people in the industry came from Fairchild. I think what was probably more interesting to me about the Fairchild experience was the, uh, was the Fujitsu uh, uh, proposed merger. And to refresh your memory there, uh, I w it became obvious to me uh, First is the chairman, Rabu, died, and uh, Ewan Baird took over as the chairman of Schlumberger. And it was very obvious to me uh, at a cocktail party one night that uh, we weren't long for this world. Fairchild was going to be sold, and maybe all the electronics business they were in was going to be sold. And with that in mind, I went to uh, try to figure out who to sell Fairchild to. And I, and, I, and I, you know, I try to put, try to think about it with a General Motors, and I said, if you look at the product overlap between what General Motors buys and Virtual makes, it's, it's poor. So I, so I came, it came, it finally decided that the thing to do was to try to sell it to one of the Japanese, because the Japanese had a need, and and that need was they didn't understand the Western market, and uh, on the other hand, they had good manufacturing capability and and so forth and so on. So we put together the merger. 
and basically uh, the would, product would be marketing the Western world of uh, under the name Fairchild and the Asian world under the name Fujitsu. We'd man manufacture at the lowest cost and manufacture, and uh, we would design and market uh, geographically. And so Fairchild would have an organization that would embody what was Fujitsu's in California, in the United States, in Europe. And Fujitsu would do the same thing in, in Asia. And uh, to not to overdo this, it ended up we lost it because we could never get to the Justice Department. And it's never denied because if we get up to two 18 wheelers versus worth of documents that had been sent there and they still had, couldn't make a decision and finally it just came unglued because uh, uh, people start getting nervous and all well, these kinds. The claim was was the military business. Yeah. Was that this would give and Craig Computer Japanese control over these two mm -hmm. primary areas. Right. And the and and the and the supercomputer Craig. The uh, the the thing I find interesting about it is that the problem still exists with the Japanese companies today that we were trying to fix back then. And this was you know, 12 years ago. I think Fujitsu, had we put that together and had we learned how to, to decide what R&D, which, 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 des which designs, which products to take to market, what to do on an ASIC level in the U.S. Uh, versus a standard product, had, had we rationalized all those resources and put that together, I think we would have had the, the pattern for a Japanese company to be successful in the, in the future. And I think that was the lost opportunity out of that, only to see it go to national, where it's just, I thought it was a very poor decision on their, pace, on their part because it only put linear with linear and TTL with TTL. It, it didn't have, uh, well, it didn't, bring, didn't bring any value added to well, it. How much, how much uh, did national pay? Uh, as I remember, they only paid 100 million cash. I had an LBO offer in at 180 to 200. I can't remember, but there was a 50 million in paperback. But Schlumberger uh, never accepted uh, an LBO because, it's, it's, in my opinion, the board never wanted to be embarrassed. They wanted to get off the books. Uh, if it had been a success, it would have embarrassed them because they couldn't make it a success. If it had been a failure and they didn't collect their 50 million, it would have been an embarrassment because they'd have to do that. It's like two out of three in a, in a football, you know, two interceptions or interception. Two out of three, three things are bad or something, I think, is, a, is kind of what happened. So tell us about the wagon wheel. Okay. The guys would go there after work, you know, we'd work until 7 o'clock or something like that, and, and we'd go up there and have a few beers. And it's always a huge crowd there. I mean, you couldn't sit down. Everybody was standing up. And you know, the marketing guys like Jerry Sanders telling about the, the job he took away from TI, you know, down at Hughes. Or, and uh, the manufacturing guys talking about how they beat a yield problem, or, and, and so on and so on. And it, it, it was, I mean, yeah, we were, there was drinking going on, but a lot of, of business discussion and, and, and uh, enthusiasm building and so on. It was, it was, it was a really very positive. All marketing and manufacturing, because R&D was way the hell over, you know, in Stanford. <laughs> but a lot of interesting things happened. The, uh, the women, of course the wives, this was not particularly good for families at all. And uh, there were a lot of family problems. I had a few myself. And, uh, but this one day, uh, J Jack McGarrion, who was our materials manager, uh, is at the bar and he's he's uh, sweet talking this girl uh, at the bar. And uh, in walks his wife and all six kids. You know, you go chump 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 chump. They walk in. <laughs> and they go up to, to uh, over to uh, to Jack, and Jack turns around. He sees his wife and all his kids, and he says, "Oh shit, Shirley, <laughs> the place just broke up." <laughs> so, so uh, you know, funny. The uh, 
the other interesting thing about that is, you know, National in 86 bought Fairchild, what was left of Fairchild, and which was a hell of a deal for us, actually. And, and we isolated everything that we didn't want, like the, the Wisman plant, which was the ground was contaminated. Like we just built a wall and kept us away from that. But after we bought, uh, we had, uh, you know, we were in the process of taking everything out that we wanted. And I got a hold of Tom Bay, and uh, for when we took a walk through the old Wisman road plant which is where we had grown up, really. And uh, from there, we said, well, we've done that. Now we've got to stop at the wagon wheel. I hadn't been back in the wagon wheel and since uh, I left Fairchild, which was 67. So I hadn't been there for about 20 years. And we went in, and there was no one there. It was completely empty, except for one girl who was sitting there. And that girl used to work at Fairchild, and she worked at National, and she was sitting there by herself, uh, having a beer, you know. And, and uh, we just happened to run into her. It just struck me as uh, you know, strange as hell. She was sort of, I guess, reliving the old days. Yeah, but you're right <clears throat> that uh, the discussion was almost entirely on business aspects. The only thing you talked about. And there was a cross pollination. Uh, when the Motorola guys came out, Hogan and his people, from Motorola, they were shocked that this was going on. Yeah. Uh, uh, not only the immoral activities with, with women, but the uh, uh, trade secrets being bantered about. Yes. And they issued an edict that um, you would not go yeah. there. Yeah. And I think productivity went down. Sure, absolutely. I mean, much of the... Money of the, uh, by the way, there wasn't a, heck, a lot of moral, immoral activity. It really wasn't. I mean, I'm, I'm not approved, but there wasn't really much of that going on. But, you know, I mean, you, you got a pretty girl, it's easy to talk to. Um, but I'm, a, I'm not aware of uh, going much further than that. The, 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 you know, if you have uh, distinct organizations like manufacturing and marketing and R&D and how you you have conflicts uh, between these. Uh, it's best to try to structure things as down to a low level as possible. But in many ways, you can't entirely. And a lot of these problems were resolved at, uh, at the wagon wheel, really. But when Schlumberger took over, it was hopeless then, because they knew nothing at all about the business. And they put a guy in there to run it who knew absolutely nothing about it. But you know indicated to the world that he did know how to run a business and he was going to straighten out Silicon Valley. It was, uh, by then it was called Silicon Valley. And it was nonsense, truly nonsense. So it was sort of, uh, you know, a, uh, I think a, a uh, preordained that once all of that, uh, the former management left and took all those people that they, it was tough for them to, to survive. And the only reason they lasted anywhere long as long as they did is because of that huge amount of money that was flowing in from the planar patents. Mm -hmm. Well, and also from Schlumberger. They dumped a ton of money. They sure did, that's right. Yeah, they pumped a lot of money in. And so uh, why, why did you buy them at, at National then? For a number of reasons. One. The, uh, we needed uh, plant expansion, and they, had the, they still had the Portland plant, which uh, is still a Fairchild facility now, as a matter of fact, uh, again. And very good facility. Very great people there, what have you. We wanted that, and also we wanted their discreet business. They had, uh, our discreet business, we had squeezed it so much that it was fairly, we had, we're at the stage we either had to drop it or do something significant to make a significant business. And, uh, and uh, they had a big transistor and diode business, really big. So we paid $125 million for that thing. And uh, we sold off real estate that got us more than $125 million right after we bought it. You know, it's, we sold a plant in Korea and the plant in uh, Brazil and one in Singapore and what have you. Uh, 
and uh, we sold the uh, that what was their microprocessor that was uh, the Clipper. The Clipper. We sold that the rights to that to this outfit in Florida. Intergraph. You're right. Yeah. So we got all 125 million back, and uh, and we made the transistor and diode business a, a very nice little business. And then in in uh, you know what is it 94 we sold that package back to the employees for 500 million bucks and Fairchild's back in business again. <laughs>